Okay, good morning, everyone. Let's see, we have almost 30 people here. Uh, can you see my slides? The presenter view, and I hope you can hear me. Okay, so I would say let's let's slowly start. So my name is Yasmin Ahic, and together with uh, Simon Barner, we will be giving this tutorial on handling concurrency in embedded system, embedded software systems from architectural point of view. When it comes to this tutorial, it's divided in three sessions, in three parts. In the first session, we want to discuss really the fundamental issues with concurrency in embedded software systems, but from architectural point of view. In the second part, the so Simon will present uh, modeling and the design space exploration methods for mixed critical software systems. And in the third part, we will be going on into the direction of uh, source code, synchronization, and discuss why synchronization in concurrent systems is an architectural decision. So let's start with the, with the first session. At any point, if you have any question, feel free to write in the chat or uh, interrupt. Anyhow, at the end of the session, we will have a time for, uh, for discussing some maybe 10 to 15 minutes. So here is the agenda for the, for the first session. In this first part, we really want to understand what are the fundamental issues with the multi-course and the concurrency to understand the, the basics of software architecture and to relate these two. So to understand important architectural properties of embedded multi-core concurrent systems from architectural point of view and how, they are, how their properties are affected by concurrency. When it comes to the literature, uh, here are some important references that we'll be referring to during the tutorial. Some of them, especially this one, so uh, glimpse of real-time uh, systems theory and practice in the wake of uh, multiple processors and mix mixed criticality. Uh, this one and the others are actually previous tutorials organized by Hypeak, mostly from the Hypeak Summer School Agassiz. Okay, so let's start already with the material. I hope you have some basic understanding of the multi-course that you have heard about multi-course and the multi-threading. Anyhow, we will try and clarify these terms and uh, slowly go into the direction why are these are actually architectural issues. So our goal is really to explain why concurrency and multi-course are architectural issues from the software architecture point of view to explain and discuss the, the goals of the design space exploration. And like I have said, to really try and explore and discuss why synchronization is an important design decision. So let's start uh, with by discussing uh, this, this diagram and uh, why are we dealing with the multi-course and the concurrency in the, in the first place. So you're probably aware of, uh, of the Moore's law. So the Moore's law says that uh, the number of transistors on a surface of a chip or on the same die will double every 18 to 24 months. So that's something that we can see here on, on this diagram. The trend is slowing a bit, but Moore's law is still very much, very much alive. Currently, as we are decreasing our production process, we are around in production process between seven nanometers and 10 nanometers. On the other hand, what we also see on this graph is that um, since 2006, approximately, we are not increasing the frequency of CPUs significantly. The reason for this, so although we are increasing the number of transistors on the same processor as the Moore law has predicted, the reason why are we not increasing frequency of the multi-cores is of the so-called breakdown of Denar scaling. So what is a Denar scaling? Denar scaling was scaling that suggested that uh, as we manufacture our processors, how should we scale their parameters? So originally Denar scaling stated this, as dimensions of the transistors reduced by 30%, effectively, uh, effectively implying that their area is reduced by 50%. That means that also their switching delay is reduced by 30%. And that also means that uh, it's possible to increase their operational frequency by 40%. At the same time, their voltage is decreased also by 30%, which in return means that their 
power consumption is reduced by 50%. What does it mean? It means that as we have the number of transistors doubled on the same die, we increase the frequency by 40%, but we keep the power consumption constant. If we take a look at this graph, we see that the uh, power consumption has actually grown uh, through, through the time. And the reason for this is that the manufacturer of the processors have tried to squeeze as much as possible uh, performance from the CPUs. That means increasing the frequency as, as much as po possible. However, what has happened here in the, oops, what has happened here in the 2006 is the break of the NRR scaling. That means that we cannot reduce operational voltage anymore. That means that if we increase frequency now, the power consumption will increase in a nonlinear way. So we have reached a point how much we can cool down the processors with the current power consumption. That means cooling it with the, with the pure air. And if you want to cool it further, if you increase frequency further, that means that we need some special specialized cooling solutions, which is not the option for the uh, wide area electronics. So what happens currently is that we cannot increase frequency any further because if we do, CPU will burn. However, since uh, we are not able to increase performance with the increase of the frequency, manufacturers of the CPUs have turned to other ways of increasing the performance of the CPUs. That means also using this number of different transistors that we are still getting in the each and every generation of the CPUs. And they have primarily, uh, they have primarily turned to increasing the number of the cores. That means number of the parts of the, C of the software parts that we can process concurrently or in parallel. So the current situation in the manufacturing of the CPUs and the processing industry is as follows. The free launch, which was guaranteeing that our software would execute faster with every new generation of the CPU is over because we are not increasing frequency anymore. The manufacturers are using the existing increasing number of the transistors in order to make some improvements in the architecture of the CPUs, which results in the performance increase. And they have turned completely now to the create using these additional transistors for manufacturing new cores, which can process parts of the so, which can process software parts concurrently and in parallel. When it comes to the drivers, which were driving the industry for using the, uh, the multi-cores. These are to improve execution time, to improve the throughput, to enable the redundancy. That means if there are several tasks running, why not to create redundant tasks that if one fails, the other ones can take over. Uh, at the same time, improving the availability and reliability of the system and also power consumption. That means uh, because frequency and power consumption do not have linear relationship. If you decrease frequency a bit, we significantly reduce the power consumption. So this is the current state of the affair when it comes to the concurrency and when it comes to the parallel processing of our CPUs. Now let's try to put this in the context, this new reality in the context and the perspective of the software and system architecture. So here is one of the definitions of the software architecture. It says software architecture is the structure of the structures of the system, which comprise software components, the externally visible properties of those components and the relationship among them. So let's try and discuss these terms which are highlight, highlighted. When it comes to the external visible, externally visible properties uh, of the components, that means their functionality, and that means their quality properties. So for example, performance, how fast one component will execute its functionality. When it comes to the relationship between the components, we're usually referring to interfaces for data transfer between software components, and also other type of the dependencies which lead to coupling. From the perspective of the concurrency and the multi-course, what is interesting for us are usually these quality properties, at least in the first part. In the second part, we will discuss these depend dependencies and how they reflect and affect our software system. So when it comes to the software architecture, a few more terms that we need to clarify in order to proceed with this are requirements, drivers, and decisions. 
So we, we have said that when it comes to these externally visual properties, uh, in the first part, we are mostly dealing with the quality properties. So how this relates to requirements, drivers, and decisions. Requirements are usually stake, stakeholders' wishes and the concerns. Not all of them are always relevant, but they are there and the stakeholders express them. Stakeholders are any individual or a group of the individuals who may be affected or perceived to be affected by a certain project or a decision. Now, from all of these requirements, it's usually necessary to extract drivers, which are significant requirements, those requirements which are driving the project. And these can be functional drivers, these can be quality drivers, these can be business drivers, and these can be some specific constraints which exist in the project. Finally, for each of these drivers, regardless which type they are, it's necessary to make some design decisions to address them and proceed with the design. So those are basic terms of the software architecture and through the quality properties we relate them to the ideas of the concurrency and the multi-course. Uh, the typical process is as follows. So it's usually necessary to collect the requirements, to filter out the requirements, so to identify those which are significant for the project, do design space exploration and see what are the available solutions, from the available solutions, do the reasoning and choose the ones which are appropriate. And for those which are appropriate and adequate, make adequate decisions and then proceed with the development of the system. So it's not a, architecture is not a phase, it's just a part of the process of the software engineering, depending on the development methodology, if it's in a different ways. But this is a general idea, how we go from the concerns and the wishes to the design decisions. Okay, so why is this important to have this uh, architectural view on concurrency and uh, on the multi-course? Well, we have mentioned at the beginning, what are the drivers for using the multi-course? Execution time, re uh, reliability, availability, so that means introducing some sort of the redundancy and power consumption. We will be mostly focusing on the execution time in this tutorial. So from the architectural point of view, we consider these as quality properties and the quality drivers. But general in software architecture, the quality properties and the quality drivers are the hardest type of the drivers and the requirements to be expressed and to be captured. Because usually what we get from our stakeholders is that the system should be fast, our system should be secure, our system should be safe, available, reliable. So all of these nice keywords, but in reality, they do not mean much. So a common approach in software architecture is to take each of these keywords, each of these quality properties, and put them in a certain context of functionality. So let's see how that looks like. One of the approaches for taking a quality property and putting it in a context is to use, for example, a template. And one template has been suggested uh, in a book called Pragmatic Evaluation of uh, Software Architecture by Jens Nodel and Matthias Nab. So they suggest the following. If you are describing certain quality property of a system, so quality driver that uh, for which we need to make a certain decision to meet it, we should describe the following. We should describe the environment. So that means a starting state in which the system is, stimulus, so what leads to the change of the system state, and what is the expected outcome after the stimulus, expected outcome, expected state of the system. For each of these, it's necessary to quantify all related quality properties. So in this first part, we will investigate what are all those related quality properties when it comes to the multi-course and the concurrency, and how they are related to those primary set of the uh, quality drivers that you mentioned at the beginning. So let's first start by identifying the basic set of the quality properties, uh, which we have mentioned at the beginning. So if we think about the performance, we can say it's equivalent in what we're trying to do here to the execution time. Redundancy and the power consumption. So these are our three main quality drivers and we will, discuss, we will be discussing them further. Mostly we'll be focusing on the execution time. So let's try to put execution time and the multi-course in the same context by using this template, which we have just described. So this is a very naive 
example. So let's say that we have an application which is executing on a single core CPU. So number of the cores is one and there is some execution time. We are migrating to a double core CPU. So the number of the cores is two. And as a response of that stimulus, we want to see that our execution time is reduced by double. Like I said, this is a very naive approach, but that might be the first impression about using the multi-cores. Reality, however, is much different. And when it comes to the concurrency and multi-cores, now we'll be discussing two laws which are setting the theoretical boundaries of what kind of speed up we can achieve by using the multi-cores. So that means processing certain tasks in parallel. The first law that we will be discussing is called the Amdahl's law. So already in, uh, uh, in this 19, 1967, uh, so well before the breakdown of the Denard scaling, Amdahl published his paper. And in this paper, he has this quote. So if one decided to improve the performance by putting two processors side by side, with shared memory, it would end up with 2.2 times much hardware. So for his setup and with the maximum mode of 1.8 speed up. So that means if there are two processors, the maximum speed up according to Amdahl because of the usage of the, of the shared usage of the other hardware parts would be 1.8. So that already is not what we were expecting. It's already less than two if we have two processors. Why is this the case and what are other implications of the Amdahl discussions? Well, Amdahl discussions will later, will later summarize into something which is called Amdahl's law. And the conclusions are the following. The conclusions of the Amdahl's are that if we take our software and divide it into parts which can execute in parallel, the total execution cannot be faster than our slowest task in the system. That seems logical and uh, obvious, but it's an important implication. So if we take our software, divide it into tasks, and we execute all of those tasks, the total execution, regardless how many cores we have, cannot be faster than the slowest task in the system. Another assumption that Amdahl has made is about the scaling of this part, which can be parallelized in the software. So what he has said is the following. If we have n cores, how can we calculate what is the speed up of our system. So we calculate how the software would execute if we execute on a single core and if we would execute on a multi-core with the n cores, we divide that. So sequential execution and the multi-core execution and we get the speed up. In the first case, the execution is part that cannot execute in parallel. So cannot be divided to execute on several cores. And the second one is the part that can be paralyzed and divided to execute on several cores. But in the case of the sequential uh, execution, these are just the simple sum. If we have an execution on the multiple cores, the part which can be paralyzed can execute on the multiple cores. That's why it's divided with the number of the cores. So important assumption here that Amdahl has made is that uh, a parallel part of the problem can scale indefinitely with the number of the cores, which actually is rarely or almost never the case. So Amdahl, what, Amdahl has assumed and made a very pessimistic prediction about the execution time on the multi-cores. It says that we cannot be faster than the slowest task. It says that uh, it made an assumption, which is not always correct, uh, which is actually really correct, that this part which we can paralyze can indefinitely be scaled with the number of the cores. And it has also made an assumption that whatever happens, that means if we keep in increasing the number of the cores in our system, and we have this part which can be indefinitely paralyzed, eventually we will be limited by the part of the software which cannot be paralyzed and which can only execute sequentially. So these are important assumptions of the Amdahl's law. And in total, we can conclude that what was Amdahl actually observing was a fixed problem. So consisting of a part which can be executed sequentially and the part that can be uh, paralyzed. And he was looking how to improve execution time of a single task. 
this is very, as I have said, pessimistic projection of uh, what can be achieved uh, with the, with the multi-cores. So if we take the results of an experiment and on the left side is a speed up and on the, so on the Y axis is a speed up on the X axis is a number of the cores. If we have only 1% of solder, which cannot be paralyzed, which is excellent case actually. And if we have, so that for that 1%, if we have 64 cores, the speed up is only around 35 times. So you could say it's almost double less than what we would be expecting with adding the 64 cores. So it's a very pessimistic way of observing what can we do with the multicores. Another law which is valid in this area is Gustafsson's law. So Gustafsson's law offers a different perspective. It pointed to the fact that um, as we scale the number of the cores, we are also scaling the problem. So that means the Amdahl law was limited. How can we improve execution time of a single task? While well, Gustafsson's law said, okay, as we're increasing the number of the cores, we're increasing the size of the problem. So what we are actually doing is we are increasing the throughput. So two, uh, the important conclusions of discussions of these two laws are, it is not possible for an application to execute faster than its lowest task. Paralyzed part of an application does not scale automatically with the number of the cores, but it is always possible to increase the overall problem size and therefore it's possible to increase the throughput of the system by using the multicores. So these are some theoretical boundaries when it comes to using the multicores. And this has been uh, visualized. There is a really nice paper about it. So this is a Amdahl's observation. If you have some part which can be paralyzed, some part which can execute statically, uh, sequentially, have, as we increase the number of the cores, we are trying to decrease the execution time. In the case of the Gustafsson, what we're trying to do, we're trying to add more and more work to be done, but we are executing that work in a fixed time frame. So the problem is not fixed, but the time slot is fixed and we are trying to increase the throughput. So these are technical theoretical limitations of what we can achieve with the multicores. How this fit in with the quality requirements and quality drivers of our software system. So when we, when he said that we are focusing on the execution time, we didn't actually say on what kind of execution time we are focusing. So if you think about the execution time, there are two dimensions. In terms of the uh, execution time in one dimension, we can observe average execution time and we can observe worst case execution time. In terms of the type of the software, what we can observe also is single task and a group of the task. Meaning if a single task, if you have a single task and we are reducing its average execution time, what we're getting out of it as a quality property is better user experience. And if you are decreasing its work case execution time, this is relevant usually for the real time, for the systems with the real time constraints. Now, if we have a group of tasks and if we are reducing their average execution time, that means that we can usually add more features to be executed in the same time slot. So equivalent to what Gustafsson Law was saying. And if you're talking about the worst case execution time, again, that usually means for the, that's usually relevant for the systems with real time constraints and also relevant in the systems where you want to achieve this freedom from interference between the tasks. When it comes to the embedded software systems, this is usually how the software executes in embedded systems. So there is a set of tasks, there is an infinite loop, they're executing one after another in iterations. And in case of the interrupts, we have the handling of the interrupts. So this is important in order so that we try and relate these quality properties that we have discussed with the properties of the embedded systems. So I have already explained the uh, real time constraints and the worst case execution time uh, and their relationship. What is also important here to mention when it comes to the execution time are the costs of the embedded systems. So if we have engineers of embedded systems, they really try to, opt to optimize their hardware, hardware resources, because if they do not do that, they will have the underutilization of the hardware resources. That means that the product which they are producing actually could be cheaper. 
And if this is something that the competition discovers, it can use to make a cheaper product. So these are important quality properties of the embedded systems in terms of the, the cost, execution time, and the real time constraints. Finally, what is important as we are adopting the multi-course in order to improve these quality properties of our system is that such decision does not introduce new bugs and does not compromise correctness of the software. And we will see now what does it mean. So we had the first set of the quality properties and now we have the finer grain set of the quality properties, meaning that uh, when it comes to usual execution time, we have average execution time. So a driver can be to improve average execution time. Uh, if the system has a real time constraints and it's safety critical, it's necessary to make a decision and to reduce the worst case execution time. And at above all, it's necessary not to compromise execution correctness. So this is a second set of the quality properties. I have said that uh, for, the, for the time being, we are focusing on the execution time. And we have the first set which we started and we have the expand set of the quality drivers. Now, the question here is how do we actually can measure execution time of our software and what does it mean to claim a certain execution time of our software? In the very simple deployment scenario, we have a task which is executing on a certain core. However, life is a bit more complex than that. So when certain task is executing on a certain core, what we have here are the pipelines of the instructions. And then there is a cache and the certain cache policies based on which uh, the information is changed in the cache. Then there is a memory bus. There are different parts related to the uh, random access memory and so on and so on. So there are different accesses to the memory. There are different operations. In conclusion, there are different source of the non-determinism which can occur when executing software on hardware. These sources of the non-determinism and the measurement of the execution time have been discussed really nicely in another tutorial. So design and analysis of time critical systems in the ACATS uh, summer school in 2017. So if you want to go deeper into that, I would definitely recommend to revise this, uh, this tutorial. What is important for us is the, is the following. So it's important that if we have these different caches and the different memory buses that we get a feeling, for example, how much a certain cache miss, how much a certain access to the memory really costs in terms of the, in terms of the time. So what we can see here is that if uh, instruction has been executed purely by using registers. We're talking about the picoseconds, but if it needs to go to RAM, for example, this already costs dozens of the nanoseconds, or if it needs to go to some uh, permanent storage, such as the hard drive of the SSD, we are already talking in the range of the milliseconds. So this is the range that we are talking about uh, when it comes to different operations and their influence on the execution time. So all of this discussion so far, has been without discussing any software implications. So when it comes to the software implications, we can have software which is programmed by developers. If we add on top of that, the, uh, the libraries which the developers are using, the situation gets more and more complex. So this is one example of uh, predicting uh, execution time using a tool, a uh, tool is called from the app. So, uh, what we definitely see is a huge difference if there is a single access uh, to a memory, if that memory is in the register and if that memory is in the uh, random access memory. And the question is, is that relevant for our execution time and is that relevant for all our quality properties? So this all has been discussed on the level of a single core CPU. Now let's see how this reflects on the multi-core CPUs. So let's say that we have uh, two tasks and these two tasks are executing on two different cores. Situation gets now even more complex because now these tasks not only have these different sources of individual 
non-determinism. There is also there are also new sources of the non-determinism because of uh, this set of the hardware interferences. For example, these tasks which execute share cash. The question is what is the replacement policy and what will be the state of the cash that the certain tasks see when it start executing. Uh, because of the cash sharing, it's also necessary to ensure the cash coherence. So all the tasks need to see the same memory layout regardless where the data has been saved. Then tasks are also sharing the memory bus. So if one task is one core is using the memory bus, other one has probably have to, has to ho uh, hold and wait. So all of these are sources of the non-determinism and the sources of the issues when trying to predict execution time on a single core, but it gets even more complex on the multi-cores because of these hardware interferences. Now, if we discuss uh, worst case execution time, situation is even more problematic. So uh, one quote from the tutorial, which I have already mentioned says, the worst case execution time of even the simplest single path program running along on a CPU does not stay the same when other programs run on other CPUs. So here is an example, if there is a single task and suddenly if there are other tasks running, but they are not so aggressive with allocating the resources. And here is the execution time of such task. If we have a different task which are running and which are very aggressive about the resources. So we can see that the execution time changes almost three times, which is a big deviation from average execution time. So this is the worst case execution time. And like I've said, really problematic on the, on the multi-cores. The situation gets only worse with the multi-cores because there are more and more quality properties and drivers that we have to consider. So what about the scheduling? So let's say, as in the first example, on one core, we have a task, seven milliseconds, and the other one, five milliseconds, they're executing. And now we want to add a new task, which is seven milliseconds, seven seconds, sorry. The question is, where do we add this task? Well, if you just, let's say, add it to the core and execute it on a core, where there is a five seconds task, what we get is a improvement speed up, theoretical, without considering anything else of one point, let's say six uh, speed up. Uh, and if we keep adding all of those sources of the uh, of the non-determinism, we might end up actually executing it slower than on the single core. But what is important here to add is uh, what kind of design decisions we can make on this level. So uh, the first one of them is where to put a task to execute. And the second one is, are two cores really the best solution for this? Or we need to go, for example, for a course, uh, four cores solution. So let's see how this affects uh, prediction of the execution time. So considering scheduling, in this case, for the scheduling, it's not only about adding a core, uh, adding a task to a certain core, but it's also considering all of this complexity for that scheduling and all the outcomes that can, that can uh, come out of, from this scheduling and execution on such a complex platform. Because of this, engineers in embedded systems prefer to limit concurrency as much as possible because they want to predict worst case execution time and average execution time for a certain scenario. So that means for a certain execution on course, for certain execution of the tasks uh, considering certain scheduling policy, and they, they, for example, want to handle interrupts on a certain course. They want to give priorities to a certain course, uh, which uh, and the tasks which lead us to the third set of the priorities of the quality drivers for adapting multi cores. So those are core affinity. If a certain task is pinned to a certain uh, core, if there is a certain scheduling policy, for example, in terms of the priority and so on, and if uh, how interrupts are organized, what is their priority and where they are going to be handled. So. These properties are possibly to uh, to introduce in the in the embedded systems. Uh, are there any questions? I think I saw. Okay. I think we can discuss then this at the at the. Ah, okay. The top of my screen seems to be blocked. Uh, is it now better? No, there's also something on the right hand side now. Okay. Is it now better? 
Yes, but there's still something on the top. Okay, unfortunately, I don't think I can. Is it now better? Sorry, no. Ah, yeah, now no, it's good again. Okay, sorry, it's uh, double screen and... Uh... Now it's at the bottom again. <laughs> Let's see where it blocks less content. If there is content, I will just keep switching it up and down. Okay, so uh, I have discussed the scheduling. Here are some definitions about the scheduling, but I would skip them so you have them on the slides. What is important here when it comes to the scheduling? When it comes to the scheduling, the following parameters are in the game. The first one is the number of the resources. That means number of the course the number of the tasks, and then for this combination, number of the course and the number of the, uh, number of the tasks is necessary to maximize the utilization of the course, is necessary to minimize the preemption, and is necessary to minimize the spinning. Utilization of the course, I think it's clear, so we don't want to end up with the underutilized hardware because that means a higher cost for something that you're not using. What about preemption and the spinning? Preemption generally is not considered to be a good strategy if we want to make sure that we can predict our worst case execution time, because if you preempt the task, we never know what is the state of the cache. And that, as we have seen, can have a significant influence on the execution time. The second one is spinning. So alternative to preemption is if we don't want to preempt the task and it's waiting for something, we just can leave a task to spin. So basically not doing anything, waiting for something to be available. This increases utilization, but it's actually also a waste of time. So these are uh, parameters which are important. And then there's a theorem in, from 1992, which says no optimal online scheduler can exist for a set of jobs with two or more distinct deadlines on any platform where, where number of the course is larger than one. So this is the theoretical limitation that there exists. In practice, so I will try then now to move this up. Okay, I hope you can see it. In the practice, what does it mean? So let's say that we have our example. We have two cores, we have three tasks, and we execute the first task. So after five seconds, this task is executed, this task is still executing, we are trying to schedule this task. Whatever we do, so whatever scheduling we do at this point, we are still going to have five seconds of the underutilization. So here really this, the, the question about the online scheduling is when it's too late to start doing the scheduling. And like I've said, this is just a superficial overview of the topic, but there is a excellent tutorial, uh, which I recommend again, which really goes into the details and uh, also how to overcome those limitations of the of the previous theorem at least to to minimize them to a certain point okay so what would be ideal in in this case in the this case of the scheduling if we have these three tasks is if we take one task and divide it into two parts and theoretically ideally not really but let's consider ideal case we would end up with the tasks that take the same execution time on the both course. So we take task three and divide it, execute it a bit here, execute it a bit here. And theoretically we have the two times of the speed up because we have two cores. What are the potential problems here? Well, one potential problem is that these threads might communicate over the shared memory. If they need to communicate over the shared memory, we have to think the problem if they communicate over the shared memory we don't synchronize them is reflected in terms of the concurrency bugs for example data races so here is one example in the first case threads are executing their operations on the shared memory but these operations are sequentially ordered so there are no problems in the second case these operations overlap namely before thread one writes back its results thread two reads the state of the shared memory. That means after this point, when thread one writes back the results of its processing, thread two is operating on outdated shared memory data. And when it writes back the results, it's basically overwriting this thread results. A simple example to, a simple solution for this is to introduce synchronization. For example, locks. The problem now with the locks is that 
one thread has to wait for another before it completes its execution in order to proceed. So the result is correct, but it has a further implication on the quality of the system, especially on the execution time. We will see later with the synchronization how this, how this develops even further. But this leads us to important fourth set of the properties, which is if you're thinking about the threads, how to partition software into threads. What is the startup time of the threads? So if the startup time of the threads is lower than the functionality execution of the threads, then that doesn't make sense because in that case, we are actually wasting time. We are creating the overhead. What is the synchronization between the threads? What are the liveness properties? So how the synchronization will influence execution time, but also the progress guarantees. What are the concurrency bugs which can, be ex which can exist? And besides the concurrency bugs, there is also an interesting type of the bugs here, the bugs that originate because of the concurrency. They are not there on the shared resources. So the values of the shared memory is correct, but there are certain execution paths with, which exist because of the concurrency. So in total, this is the overview of the, of the pro uh, quality properties uh, from the architectural point of view when it comes to the concurrency and the, and the multi-course. So the first set is clear, uh, relatively we have focused on the execution time. The second set is discussing what kind of execution time can be improved and what does it bring. The third set is related to limiting concurrency, especially to limit the sources of the non-determinism and to optimize software for a specific hardware configuration. And since we are in better systems, this is highly appreciated. And the fourth set is related to the, the concepts of the partitioning of the tasks into threads. So in summary, I would like now to discuss the potential use case scenarios. So the potential sets of the instances of those uh, drivers uh, according to the template that we saw at the beginning. So we can skip this part. So let's start with the, with the first case. So really the, the free launch. Uh, if we have a single task, which is executing on a CPU, and if we migrate it to a CPU with a, let's say, higher number of the cores, can we have significantly reduced execution time? So let's see how this propagates. If we have a task, which is not partitioning, which is not partitioned, so a single task executing, no other task, and we move it to a CPU with a higher number of the cores, well, this is irrelevant because those additional cores are not really contributing to anything. When it comes to the CPU improvements that exist in the new generation of the CPUs, they can play a role, but this is out of our scope. So we're not discussing this in terms of the concurrency. The frequency might be increased in the new generation of the CPU, might not, but so that means that this is minimal or relevant. Significant improvements can be made in the memory, organization, hierarchy, and so on. But again, this is out of our scope. So in case of this free launch, we could say that really migrating a single task to a new multi-core CPU platform, really we cannot expect any significant reductions of execution time. Second scenario is if we have a multiple tasks, they are migrating to a new multi-core CPU, can they significantly reduce their execution time and the important parameters for this are the number of the cores and the set of the set three of the parameters. So we have several tasks, we are migrating them to a new multi-core platforms. The outcome, so the execution time will depend on the number of the cores that we have and on this set of the parameters, meaning how we do the scheduling and how we handle other operations, depending are we aiming for the better average execution time or the worst case execution time. In this case, we are not considering uh, any partitioning of the task, just pure migration of the several tasks to a new platform. In the third case, uh, what we have, that means we have uh, multiple tasks. They are executing already on the multi-core multi multi platform. Can we add new features to improve the user experience, but keep the execution time acceptable? So this is another type of the driver that we might have in the multi-core system. So mainly what is important here and what we, the only thing that we can affect is the scheduling policy. 
of course, under the assumption, we're still uh, observing the case when we, where we do not have any partitioning of the tasks. So scheduling perhaps core affinity and uh, how we handle interrupts, maybe we can organize these parameters in order to squeeze out some performance if we keep adding new tasks. The next scenario is where we have uh, multiple tasks. They're executing on a single core C on a multi-core CPU, and we want to try and to improve their execution time. So we are not adding new tasks as in the previous case, we just have the existing ones and we want to reduce their overall execution time. Again, if we don't do any partitioning, this is only possible by setting this third set of the parameters, namely scheduling and then other parameters. So two more scenarios to go. The first one is, okay, we have tasks, we are moving to uh, multi-core, so they are executing on, on multi-cores, and we want to partition the tasks into threads. Can we do that in a way that we reduce the overall execution time? Uh, in this case, we are in this, uh, the fifth scenario, we are talking about a single task, so it's executing on multi-core, we want to partition it in order to have threads which are taking advantage of these cores, can we have significantly lower execution time? So in this case, if it's, if this is the wish uh, to do that, uh, we'll try to put this down, okay. Uh, what are the important parameters which need to be quantified in this driver? Well. The first set three of the parameters, the scheduling policy, but that might not be the most important thing. The most important things are, uh, which are predominantly influencing the performance, are the ways and the means how do we partition the software. So that means if we take a task and if we can create uh, the threads which are of approximately the same execution length or of a different length, but then with the uh, scheduling we are able to execute them in a way which reduces this execution time, then this is feasible. The next thing is uh, what is the start type time of the threads? So you have to make sure that the functionality which thread executes is longer than the time which is required for a thread to start because depending on the libraries and how do we start threads, this might not be the cheapest, the cheapest option. And this is the case when there are no dependencies between threads. So single task, multi-core, you try to partition. Yes, but if you want to do that, these are the types of the additional quality drivers that you have to discuss. And the final, uh, final scenario is where we have, uh, where we consider a case uh, where we have a, a task which is executing on a CPU. We have a, oops, let me just try to put this up. Okay, uh, we have the uh, multi-core CPU. We are partitioning these tasks into uh, threads which can execute and take advantage of these multiple cores. But compared to the previous case, now we have dependencies between the threads in terms of the shared memory because in this case, they need to communicate. So in this case, the set of the parameters three and four have to be considered mainly four because what now becomes really critical are the issues with the correctness of the, of the data. So these are the cases which originated from a very simple set of the requirements that we want to use multi-course and we want to use concurrency in order to improve our execution time. So I think we can skip this, okay. Uh, just a short notice when it comes to the multi-course. So the, one of the main drivers for multi-course we are discussing now was to improve execution time of the software. That sounds great, but as we have seen, there are a lot of issues. Now, here is a, an example. If we would, for example, if we would optimize our programming languages or just use programming languages. So uh, this is a, a example from, uh, I think it's from, yeah, uh, here is the reference. So if we would execute an example on Python, and execute the same example in C, but with certain optimizations, we could get, we could reduce seven hours of the execution to 0 0.41 seconds. So the question is really, is the optimization that we have chosen in terms of the multi-course and concurrent execution the best one? For some cases, it works 
great for the embarrassingly parallel uh, programs where we don't have dependencies and the cases in the GPUs, but for the CPUs and the threads, it can be challenging. So there might be other places where we could uh, do the optimizations and get our performance. Okay, so I think we can skip this one as well. So to, to conclude then this part and then we can discuss the, the questions. So in conclusion, we started with a really limited set of drivers. So to improve the performance using multi-cores, to improve perhaps redundancy and to decrease power consumption. But as we have seen next to these basic drivers, as we start planning our system, there are related and follow-up requirements and drivers. And for this, it's necessary to make design decisions. So it's necessary to address and decide how we are going to deal with these follow-up properties of our system. And if we don't, we as architects do not make those decisions, developers will. And the question is, will the system that developers then take care of designing fulfill our requirements? That's why we're trying to make these quality drivers and quality properties explicit. In the part two, we will be exploring further the design decisions related to multi-cores in terms of safety, redundancy, and how to derive suggestions for potential architectures. And there will be some limited model of power consumption for multi-cores. And in the third part, then we'll be dealing with uh, uh, correctness and synchronization. Okay. So let's see questions. Okay, the first question is, can you please repeat what happened in 2006 that increasing the frequency was not an option anymore? Uh, this has to, it depends really on the level of which you want to observe the, the things. Uh, the first level, you can say that it was not possible anymore to reduce the operational voltage of the, uh, of the transistors. Therefore, if we increase the frequency, we would be increasing non-linearly the power consumption and then the processors would burn. So we cannot cool them with the regular air. If you want to go on the lower level, then uh, we can observe the situation really on the level of transistors and see what is the relationship between static power consumption and dynamic power consumption in transistors. And what we can see is that as the manufacturing process became more precise, so transistors became smaller and smaller, the static power consumption started increasing and uh, started reaching dynamic power consumption. Dynamic power consumption basically means power which is necessary to switch transistors from state to state. So we have these parasite, uh, current, parasite currents in the transistors which are contributing to the power consumption. And as our uh, manufacturing process became smaller, this became significant. So this is also one of the, one of the reasons uh, why we have the such a big power consumption and essentially the breakdown of the dinar scaling. I hope that answers your question. So that was from Marte Chobrnic, if I pronounce it well. Okay. Uh, so there is a, a question about the power ball. I think I explained, but if you need more let me know. Uh, more questions about oh, the windows, about the presentation. Uh, slides uh, should be already available on the link that I have set at the beginning of the of the presentation of the of the presentation. But uh, yes, they should be already there available. Uh, absolute versus relative speed up in the last speed ups chart the one with the different languages. Let's try to go there. Okay. So all the information, let me just see how can I increase this. Oops. So relative, oops. 
So this is taken directly from the front paper. Let this speed up. Um, just a second. Yes, so it depends uh, basically to which uh, result you are comparing it. So uh, uh, by relative speed up, it means, sorry, uh, absolute speed up means uh, comparison with Python. So if we, for example, have a program in Java, it's 11 times faster than the one in Python and the relative speed up, which shows additional, uh, which is basically, as, okay, this is not, well written is basically the speed up uh, in a consecutive order. So that means speed up to the previous to the previous test. So for example, the uh, the program written in C it's 47 times faster than uh, Python, but it's 4.4 uh, times faster than the program which is uh, written in Java. So I hope that, okay. Uh, sorry for this uh, upper text. I really could not find a way to to minimize it. Okay. Uh, what are the implications of having no optimal online scheduler for multiple dependent tasks? Uh, uh, yes, that's a good question. So what are the implications of not having the optimal online scheduler? Uh, first of all, I would really refer you to that uh, tutorial about the scheduling. Uh, there are two implications. The first one is the implication of the worst case execution time. The second one is the implication of the average execution time. From the average execution time perspective, we do not care so much, I would say. But for the worst, as long as we are getting in average better performance, but for the worst case execution time, the issue is critical if we want to use real time applications. So if we cannot get the optimal scheduler, if we cannot guarantee certain uh, real time deadlines, we might end up either by missing those deadlines or we can create a very confident solution, but we would end up with the underutilization of the hardware resources. So I hope that answers your question. Okay. Um, okay, question is which tutorial? Um, let me just navigate. It is this tutorial. It's, uh, if you're registered on Hypey, can I assume you are, you can access it there. Uh, and I don't think they also, they have the slides. So there are three YouTube videos and uh, this issue has been discussed in details. I just have a, maybe four or five slides, which are somehow trying to summarize the issues, but uh, in this tutorial, you can find more details. Okay, any more questions? Then if not, we will make a 15 minutes break and then we will continue with the second part.
Yeah, good morning also from my side. Um, maybe you, could you give me a brief hint if my audio is actually working? Sounds good. Okay, perfect. So uh, welcome to this uh, second session uh, in our tutorial. Uh, my name is Simon Barner. I'm from uh, Fortis, a Munich-based institute um, that deals with uh, software-intensive uh, systems. And um, there um, I'm working with my group on um, software and systems engineering um, methods based on um, model-driven engineering. So today, I'm presenting um, a work by um, Alexander Diebold, who you know, couldn't make it um, to this presentation uh, personally today. And we will give you um, some insights on um, an approach on um, automating uh, design space exploration um, by means uh, of a dependency-driven um, approach. Uh, so we will um, yeah, learn uh, what will be this um, then in, in the remainder um, of this talk. Again, um, as before, um, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free um, to raise them uh, in the chat and I will either pick them up uh, online or answer them um, at the end uh, of the session. So um, as we have heard before, um, systems are getting more and more complex. And uh, while uh, Jasmine was focusing here um, more on the, on the hardware aspects, on, on the chips, um, this, of course, applies um, to systems in general. And um, we can observe that uh, nowadays um, systems and cyber-physical systems that um, um, interact with their um, environment, uh, typically in real time and often also in uh, safety and mission critical um, scenarios, are typically software defined. So we have an um, yeah, ever increasing a set of um, functionalities um, uh, on the system with uh, a yeah, multitude of contradicting or very often contradicting requirements. There's a huge variation um, uh, within the systems, so also within the design space, we have different variants of the same system being manufactured, if you think of automobiles, for instance. And this means that uh, we also have, um, or the OEMs uh, and manufacturers have the desire to yeah, foster reuse and to achieve some uh, product line engineering, ideally uh, to um, uh, lower their uh, overall efforts. I gave you here some examples um, um, on the size, how the, how the size of such system has evolved, um, starting from a um, simple um, iPhone app in the beginning. And um, if you see how this develops, now we have already here 25 million lines of codes. And um, so if you have a look at a modern car, we're now talking about yeah, around 100 lines of code that need to be developed um, uh, also validated and ultimately also be uh, deployed um, uh, to the underlying hardware platform. Of course, um, this is a tremendous challenge um, because uh, this also results into the uh, massive uh, performance um, requirements. Um, we have uh, heard in the talk before uh, that uh, Moore's laws is still working, but we have now um, yeah, a number of problems um, on actually making use um, of these um, of the available um, power uh, in in, this, in the silicon. Um, but on the other hand, um, a from a systems um, engineering point of view, um, the platform um, adds another level um, of complexity. So if we have a look at the um, left hand um, diagram. Um, where I give you um, an overview how architectures um, um, have evolved. So um, a decade ago, uh, we still uh, had um, a federated architecture where each function would go to um, dedicated um, ECU. And so functional integration would actually um, work by, yeah, integrating these ECUs that have also been typically been um, developed by, um, by departments. So each department owned its own um, ECU. And so um, this also reflected then 
um, the um, the organizational structure. Of course, um, this is um, very inefficient on the one hand side because you get um, a huge number of ECUs. Um, so, for instance, in a, in a car, you could can have like a, up to 100 um, ECUs in a premium car. And so this is very efficient uh, when it comes to uh, weight, power consumption, and of course also production cost um, ultimately. So this is why um, the architecture has also um, devolved by fusing together um, these dedicated ECUs, whose integration, by the way, um, on, a, on the bus also creates uh, tremendous problems because you need to ensure that, for instance, real-time traffic um, yeah, is delivered um, uh, uh, on time or meeting its deadline. And so um, system architects um, were trying yeah, to um, integrate um, the functions, the, the increasing amount of uh, software-defined functions, for instance, in a car onto less um, uh, computer systems. So this um, it was done uh, stepwise uh, in cars, first by um, integrating uh, functions um, that belong together in, in so-called doma domains, such as the powertrain or the entertainment, for instance. And uh, uh, these days, we are now uh, also observing a centralized vehicle architectures uh, where we only have a very few um, uh, uh, control un control computers in a car where um, the functions are integrated and uh, we only have um, uh, multiple um, issues in the car in order to um, meet uh, redundancy requirements uh, yeah, stemming from 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 safety um, uh, constraints and with such architectures um, will not stop because ultimately we will also see and this is already happening that also functions are moved um, to the cloud this is very nice um, so from the systems uh, from the systems perspective however um, these new platforms um, that provide these um, means um, then shift the burden um, now to the um, systems engineers who have to deal with both the complexity of the software defined functions and also about uh, deploying them onto these um, uh, onto these architectures that are typically um, also running a um, complex um, system software stack such as a real-time operating system or space-time partitioning hypervisors that can be used uh, to segregate, segregate critical tasks or tasks of different criticalities from each other in order to provide the basic for actually performing um, um, this integration. On this slide, I'm giving you um, an example of a real world example um, of one subsystem in a modern car. So this could be, for instance, be a, a traffic jam assistant. Um, but already for this limited functions, we would have something like uh, 30 tasks um, that uh, it's, it's uh, in the example that that been investigated um, uh, in this uh, in this paper here that we also submitted in in, in Waters um, Challenge um, two years ago. Uh, around 10 ECUs were used, and also uh, numerous um, signals between the different tasks um, are exchanged, and. You can imagine that um, integrating such a um, an application uh, onto a, uh, onto uh, the underlying platform, considering non-functional requirements such as separation constraints between critical and non-critical tasks, temporal constraints for um, time critical um, parts of the functionality, is an enormous challenge. In particular, if you consider that this is only a yeah, fraction of the software that is used um, in a car. Now, the question is, uh, what can we do? So, um, on this slide, I'm giving you uh, an overview of um, of a sketch of uh, the development um, of um, of a huge cyber physical system such as a car, but of course it also applies, uh, applies to other domains. So we um, typically start um, with a collection of requirements, which we are also required um, to document because of 
uh, the safety assurance that we ultimately have to do. And from there, um, the initial designs um, are derived. And um, on the other hand, um, we also have to think ideally as early as possible about how to um, implement such a um, system that is still um, specified in the platform independent um, uh, fashion could be um, uh, mapped to a platform or what would actually be a good platform yeah, for this uh, system under design. And um, yeah, once we have, uh, so this is of course then an iterative process about um, collecting the requirement, after collecting the requirements, designing um, uh, the system on a logical level, um, deriving a good candidate for the, um, for the architecture, and then to um, implement um, the functionality uh, in terms um, yeah, of code and to deploy it um, to the running system. So as um, indicated earlier, um, there are numerous um, of constraints um, that we need um, to consider here. So one is timing, as mentioned before. Others are safety requirements um, that could be mitigated um, by, for instance, separating critical and non-critical functions or by placing um, uh, additional components uh, matching uh, or implementing um, safety patterns such as uh, monitors um, and so on in order to um, uh, help building the, the safety case and for the system. Uh, so also introducing redundancy um, on the hardware level and to make a choice um, uh, where to put the same functionality or functionally functionality onto the same uh, hardware units, but to use um, partitions uh, provided by a hypervisor to implement the segregation. All in all, um, yeah, this represents a huge design space where um, numerous decisions um, have to be taken and um, the artifacts um, yeah, that then can be used to, to implement the functionality have to be um, uh, provided consistently. This is one of the main challenges. And um, the focus of this talk here is now that um, the decisions that have to be taken are also dependent, uh, which uh, makes uh, things even more complicated. So for instance, um, when uh, deriving yeah, um, a safety pattern and uh, then coming to the um, solution that uh, we would need um, additional um, redundancy in the hardware. This then, of course, then also impacts um, uh, the, the scheduling and, and, and the timing uh, properties um, of the system. Now, um, the question is, what can we do about this? So one possible approach is yet to um, uh, provide a structured way to do um, design space exploration of the system and provide to provide um, means to um, compensate uh, the complexity um, as explained before of both the functionality and um, the platform. Here what would be required is um, yeah, to speed up um, the um, design process to provide some way of uh, design automation and to do um, as many um, decisions um, as early as possible. So we, we refer to this um, as front loading of um, decisions, um, which enables us to do um, coarse grained what if analysis and that uh, help uh, then the, the, the system engineer and the system integrator to estimate the impact um, of uh, decisions made um, as early as possible in order to detect potential problems um, earlier. And as mentioned before, um, these decisions are not um, independent, but um, they're, they're linked. And, and so, um, but still we would like uh, to decompose um, the decisions in order to um, May, uh, structure the problem into smaller parts to make them, uh, yeah, make it feasible to actually solve them, but also um, to 
uh, enable to reuse uh, parts of the design space exploration methodology that I will um, explain in, in, in the following. So um, in this talk, um, I will um, present to you an approach um, that uh, combines um, design space exploration um, that uh, can help us yeah, to, to answer these questions with model-based engineering leading to what we um, have coined um, model-based design space exploration. Now, um, the question may arise, why would we actually need um, integrated models? So um, why could we, uh, couldn't we just um, do it as before and um, stick with our um, traditional requirements where we, um, a traditional process where we first start by uh, collecting requirements, which is, although they are um, still tools uh, or dedicated tools out there also, this is also done very often manually and captured in textual documents. Then from this, um, these requirements, a design is derived and ultimately then um, a code um, implementation is, is implemented um, because of safety, then the traceability um, is um, established between uh, the requirements. And um, with uh, embedded systems, we are, we are still not done because typically we will also need um, in, in addition to the code, we will need complex uh, configurations that need to be uh, consistent um, with the code, such as um, scheduling tables or um, yeah, mappings of tasks um, to, to the underlying platform and so on. As you can imagine, um, managing uh, the consistency here um, is very complex and time consuming. This is why um, uh, we um, propose um, yeah, to use an integrated model um, to represent yeah, all of these artifacts um, uh, of the different phases of, of the development process. So starting with dedicated models for requirements, um, then to have models um, capturing the design, um, such as um, component models, um, state automata, um, also code-like specifications and so on, and also um, a model representing the um, hardware platform. The advantages of this is that we can uh, keep um, traces between the different uh, the models used in the different um, phases here of the development, and then use automation um, yeah, to synthesize um, implementation artifacts uh, such as code. So if we actually go um, the entire way and use um, uh, also um, uh, formal specifications um, of the um, of the functionality of the system. Although this is optional, because we could also just uh, stop when uh, modeling the with modeling the architecture, and then when the architecture is fixed, uh, uh, do the implementation um, yeah, in in a traditional uh, code based way. However, um, still in this case, um, the model is useful because we can uh, use it uh, based on the on the um, architecture uh, selected to synthesize um, the configuration uh, for the platform, um, as I have um, explained before. Now, model-based design space exploration, um, as I said, aims at Compensating the design complexity um, that is inherent um, yeah, to software-defined um, cyber-physical systems, and it does it by um, providing automated means um, to explore all the different um, alternatives um, by using either um, optimization um, methods or formal methods, so provided by some solver backends, yeah, in order to um, support. Um, the engineer um, with uh, uh, different um, suggestions for how um, good um, designs could look like. So we have um, then for DCE as the inputs, um, typically um, uh, models of the, um, of the underlying platform um, or the, the platform that we start the process with and also 
um, uh, archi at least an architectural model um, of the of the uh, application to be deployed to the platform. And from there on, we have then automation um, to decide on how to combine these artifacts, how to possibly modify them, and to um, synthesize solution artifacts such as a configuration or code. Here, the prerequisite is um, for such a process yeah, to, to work well is that the models have uh, strong semantics. Um, because if uh, this is the case, then we can uh, catch uh, errors yeah, in very early phases already. So this starts with um, as uh, in quotation marks, easy things as validating uh, the user input. Uh, so if we just have a plain boxes and wires model without any semantics, um, then we surely cannot do anything. Um, but if we provide some meaning to our models, then we can already guide the designer in, in very early phases. And um, also, if um, models have uh, strong semantics, this means that they can be uh, processed automatically. So we can automatically derive um, design alternative or potential solutions that satisfy um, certain constraints, uh, for instance, uh, stemming from safety constraints, from, from safety, but they could also be constraints stemming from, from the platform, such that a certain task can only run on, on a specialized hardware because an, an IO is only available there uh, and so on. And additionally, we can also use um, them yeah, to uh, perform optimization. Um, so to find not only just one solution that uh, satisfies the constraints, but a solution that also um, meets uh, certain design goals. So on this slide, um, I give you an overview of, of the um, overall um, process um, um, that uh, we have developed and that I will um, also demo you at, at the um, end of this um, session. So we start um, with a collection of requirements. And um, from there, uh, the system model um, is defined in terms um, of a logical hardware independent architecture of the system. And then uh, a rather fine-grained um, description of the underlying uh, platform in terms of the hardware, in terms of hypervisor partitions, um, tasks um, that are uh, actually used to, to host um, the software-defined um, functionality, and then also deployment models yeah, that link the logical part, so the software part, and, um, and, and the tasks, and that also map tasks then to hardware execution units. So um, this, these deployments um, can be um, synthesized automatically um, as one part um, of the design space exploration. And another part is uh, to perform also resource allocations um, such as um, scheduling um, of tasks. And um, as explained before, we can then use such a model yeah, to synthesize then configurations and uh, do this, for instance, in different stages by first having a platform independent configuration model, such as an, an abstract um, a scheduling um, table that then could be um, transformed further into some um, uh, product specific uh, configuration file. Speaking um, of the system model, I will now um, give you um, an overview of the of the underlying system model that we um, apply in our approach. But first off, uh, I would like to start with some uh, uh, terminology. So it is important um, to see that um, the definition that was uh, given by, by Broy in, in 2011, that um, a model is an appropriate uh, abstraction for a particular purpose. So this implies a number of things. Uh, most importantly, that of course there is not the um, single model for a, a certain system under design, but there are uh, arbitrarily many, and we have to choose one that matches um, our um, current task at hand uh, the best. And this means that models are then also um, specific um, to this to this task. 
and the differentiation um, of a model to an artifact is that we can then, for instance, um, from a model then also synthesize tangible, tangible um, products. So in the course of the development um, of the system and um, ultimately then generate the artifacts that are then deployed onto the uh, onto the final system. But artifacts also refer to all other kinds of things that are um, produced during um, the development of the system, such as rec um, requirements, documents, um, uh, architecture diagrams, uh, and so on. Now, when it comes um, to modeling, um, we also see, uh, we also have uh, uh, yeah, the differentiation between um, viewpoints and views. So here, um, I would also like to briefly explain this. So a viewpoint um, is yeah, the, the, the place from which you look at a system. So which aspects um, in the current um, uh, task you are interested in the system in. So this could be, for instance, be a logical, a logical viewpoint onto the system where we don't care about um, hardware or platform specifics yet. It could be a temporal viewpoint where we just um, care about uh, the timing um, of the system and so on. And for a viewpoint, we can then um, yeah, create, um, for instance, a model if we use a model-based design. And um, we also refer um, to this model then also um, as a view um, of the system from the respective, respective uh, viewpoint. Now, which viewpoints do we propose um, uh, in order to perform design space exploration? So um, we have been involved in, in, in a number of projects uh, where um, exactly this um, question has been uh, investigated in depth. And um, it turned out, of course, that it's important um, to have, uh, on the one hand, um, different granularity levels uh, 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 in order to describe a system um, matching the different um, phases of, of the development of the development going from very abstract description of a, of a system down to the very concrete ones from which we can then also derive implementation artifacts. But on the other hand, it's also important that we can, that we distinguish the different viewpoints um, from which to look um, at a system. And um, as already mentioned a few times before, uh, one approach that uh, worked very well is here to differentiate um, uh, these four viewpoints, namely to distinguish between a requirements viewpoint that is uh, still only captures um, the, 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 what, what the system should do and under which conditions. Then a functional viewpoint, um, refining the um, requirements viewpoint into yeah, a design of individual functions that then can be mapped into yeah, a logical viewpoint that is a design um, model um, of, of the system, but still um, platform independent. So that will only talk about components and uh, uh, their interfaces, but not uh, where components um, are um, mapped to or, or how they are actually implemented because this is then the focus of the technical viewpoint. And for each of these viewpoints, uh, we, uh, we can create um, then models at different um, uh, granularity uh, layers. So now I will give you some uh, overview about um, two of these viewpoints that we will uh, then also use uh, in uh, later and and the, and the demo um, that that I will show. So the logical um, viewpoint in our approach is represented by um, a component architecture that consists of a hierarchical um, network of components um, whose interface is specified. Um, 
by typed ports. So we have data types there, um, yeah, preventing uh, yeah also then uh, miss. Uh, uh, configuration or, or, or semantically wrong models and whose behavior uh, can be um, specified um, yeah, formally if, if this is um, uh, desired. And it's also important to note um, that um, such a component model is yeah, of course then still agnostic of, of the underlying uh, memory model um, and or any hardware um, uh, specifics. Um, the platform architecture um, um, is represented also um, by a hierarchical model where we um, distinguish um, yeah, three levels. Um, the first level is um, the, the node level uh, where a node represents um, a dedicated um, computer, so an, an ECU, um, electronic control unit, if you uh, would like to call it in, in automotive terms. The tile level um, represents um, individual um, multi-core chips that could be contained um, in an ECU. And then we also have um, the core level where we can uh, then also describe uh, the, uh, uh, the inner structure um, of a tile. And uh, having such a fine-grained model um, then is of course then the prerequisite um, to consider non-functional properties uh, such as uh, safety, because only if we know about um, the, um, for instance, the physical boundaries and default containment units uh, uh, created by, by ECUs, we can then use this yeah, to reason about, um, uh, for instance, separation constraints. The second part um, um, of the technical architecture are the task and the partition architecture. So the task architecture, you see it here um, on the top right, um, is a flat representation um, of, the, uh, of the logical architecture. So what uh, we typically do here is we have here a hierarchical network of components and in the simplest case, we can just flatten um, such um, uh, a component architecture and derive uh, a task graph um, that is not hierarchical, but that still captures all the, um, the data dependencies between um, the components. Of course, it is also possible uh, to map more than one software component into um, a single uh, task in order to group them. And uh, in order to um, define constraints, uh, yeah, which components yeah, should be um, yeah, deployed together as, as a single um, uh, deployment unit. And so this is why we can also consider these tasks here as, as runtime containers. And um, the second um, artifact here is the partition architecture that is a yeah, vendor independent um, representation of um, um, space time space partitions um, that uh, yeah we can then use yeah to cluster tasks and uh, to have additional assumptions um, on their um, on their segregations. So we consider here both uh, the partition themselves that they can host um, different tasks and also um, memory areas that can be provided by a hypervisor by virtualizing the, the physical memory um, uh, of the system. And finally, um, the um, allocations uh, and allocation tables are used yeah, to um, combine um, the different um, architectures that I have um, just explained to you. So we can uh, map um, components um, to tasks. We can map tasks to partitions if we choose to, to use um, partitions in, in our design. And ultimately we can then um, map partitions to the uh, to our hardware units, or if we uh, would skip the partition level, we would, could also directly map tasks uh, to the underlying uh, hardware. So the final um, 
input in our models um, are uh, annotations. Um, and these are yeah, properties that we can um, attach uh, to arbitrary um, model elements. So from um, the tooling perspective, it's important that, yeah, this is, yeah, can be done uh, in an extensible way. So um, it's rather easy yeah, to um, provide uh, additional properties yeah, to each of, of the model elements, such as, for instance, the worst case um, execution time uh, for a task, as we heard before, or um, sizes um, of memories, or also costs um, uh, that would be then uh, relevant during an um, automated exploration of different um, uh, alternative designs. In uh, the first session, um, Jasmine uh, went into um, the details about uh, concurrency and um, its impact um, onto uh, the integration of uh, softwares um, onto multi-core chips and uh, also reasoned about uh, the theoretical limitations that are possible here. Of course, if we're doing um, design-based exploration um, on such a um, so in early phases of the development, it's important yeah, to have uh, a coarser grained abstraction in order to allow for fast uh, um, yeah, computation of the different alternatives. And um, this is why we have uh, opted of applying the IER um, um, model of execution, where uh, IER stands for acquire, execute, and uh, restitution phases. Um, um, of a system. So namely, so if we assume that we have um, a number of tasks um, we are running on a shared memory um, a platform, we assume that um, first all tasks would uh, acquire their inputs, then perform um, their um, execution uh, on the CPUs, and then at the end um, of the execution, uh, would then write the results up to the memory. So why is it uh, reasonable uh, to, to use this rather um, uh, big assumption in the system? Uh, this is because uh, yeah, we have to somehow bound um, the interferences, um, for instance, of data fetching. So um, this was also explained by Jasmine before that um, due to the um, uh, uh, architecture, the microarchitecture of, of uh, MPSOCs and multicores, um, the uh, behavior can become uh, undeterministic. And so in order to um, uh, obtain good um, exploration results, we need to uh, make um, this assumption here. Now, um, after uh, the introduction of the underlying uh, system model of both the architectural aspects and also a glimpse of um, our assumptions on the, on the temporal aspects, I will um, give you an overview of the um, design space um, exploration framework that we have developed. So just um, as a reminder here, um, our goals were yeah, to provide automation and um, uh, to use uh, models with uh, strong uh, semantics. So the goal when developing um, these frameworks were on the one hand, yeah, for the user yeah, to uh, be very convenient to use. Uh, so to make it uh, possible for them to uh, enable or disable features um, very easily. So without having to change some, some codes or so. And um, yeah, to uh, rely um, uh, on the on the actual artifacts um, uh, that are, are that should be produced, so which makes the um, underlying um, technology yeah yeah tool independent. But this um, so while, while the underlying um, algorithms are tool independent, this artifact based approach then um, uh, enables the toolification of these approaches. And of course. Um, yeah, the, the approach should be um, should be performant and so on. So 
how did, did we um, approach this? So as I mentioned in the beginning, um, the general idea is yeah, to decompose the development of an embedded system into uh, sets of um, different activities and artifacts, such as doing the logical architecture, uh, platform independent architecture, doing um, the, um, the design of the, of the hardware platform and mapping the two things uh, together and so on. Now, the key is here that um, the uh, these artifacts and the different activities when designing such a system are actually a structure of um, the development process. And uh, we can consider two types of structure here. The first one is an horizontal structuring um, that uh, additional artifacts can be added either by a user or uh, synthesized automatically by an um, algorithm from existing ones. So this could be, for instance, um, precedence relations um, between logical components. So if we have uh, one component that sends a signal um, over a channel to another um, component, then if it comes to scheduling, we know that the sender component has to be executed first, um, resulting into um, yeah, a precedence um, uh, relation. The second um, uh, type of structure is a vertical structuring. Um, that typically um, adds um, additional details to artifacts. So again, sticking to the scheduling example, this could mean that uh, we would uh, actually perform the scheduling and enrich the task um, yeah, with the timing specifications, meaning um, that we would uh, compute its, its phase when it uh, is uh, should be executed. Now, um, the, um, as I said, the exploration is, is created in a modular way. And um, so it is um, split into so-called exploration features that um, represent the different activities in the development process, such as yeah, creating a, a partition art, art, uh, architecture, um, matching uh, uh, certain safety constraints, for instance. And um, in the uh, implementation of the algorithm, um, such a feature is um, uh, represented by different um, exploration modules, um, so actual implementations of, of the algorithms that then um, operate um, on the um, um, input artifacts and then produce um, new output artifacts. So as um, um, mentioned before, um, it is uh, essential to note that um, dependencies uh, dominate uh, design space exploration of um, cyber physical systems. So to give you um, uh, an example, uh, we consider here a task graph um, of, a, of a safety function here consisting um, yeah, of, of these tasks two and task three. And we have um, initial task graph. There are also some other tasks, a task four and a task uh, T1. And then um, because of the safety constraints, we could um, uh, come to the uh, conclusion that we would like to apply a, a two out of one uh, safety patterns. So to use um, redundancy here. And uh, so um, in our approach, this unrolling of the task graph uh, would be performed uh, first. So we would uh, then introduce this um, clone um, of, of, this, of this safety function here. And then um, only in the next step, then do the mapping um, of these uh, two um, redundant copies of this task graph um, to the underlying um, execution units. And typically, um, there would be then also a separation constraint um, uh, forcing um, these two replicas um, to different um, parts um, um, of the platform and uh, while other parts then also could be um, shared them with the same execution unit. And um, this is yeah a general um, or an example that also generalizes um, to the approach, namely um, that uh, the way the design space exploration is implemented is that um, the 
different features um, of the um, design space exploration, such as the task graph exploration or the exploration of the deployment yeah, is uh, decomposed and can also then trace the different dependencies um, as I explained. However, um, this is of course um, uh, not, not, not an easy problem because um, state-of-the-art um, methods yeah, uh, do not really um, allow this. So if we consider um, a master problem that yeah, specifies um, the entire exploration task, such as um, exploring um, the task architecture, um, partition architecture, and the, and, the, uh, and the platform architecture. This would mean that from this um, master problem, we would um, yeah, delegate to the different sub problems in, in the first step. And then in the second step, uh, collect the solutions and report back um, to the master problem uh, controlling um, the exploration. Um, of course, if we see that we produce um, contradicting uh, solutions here or that some of the sub problems uh, are infeasible, um, it is intuitively um, imaginable that um, such an approach is uh, uh, inconsistent and does also not yeah, consider that these problems here are actually coupled. So, because if I um, clone some parts of the software functionality, uh, also, typically, uh, additional hardware resources are required. This is um, why uh, we uh, propose this dependency-driven um, exploration uh, of the problem, um, where um, the dependencies are made explicit and um, the synchronization um, between the different or the current solutions of the problem are then uh, synchronized. So we would then from the master problem uh, delegate to the um, topmost sub problem, such as um, allocating um, yeah, partitions uh, to execution units. Then to the second problem um, of allocating the tasks to the partitions. And then in the final step, uh, schedule uh, the tasks um, uh, such that um, the uh, the constraints um, of the subproblem two is then um, satisfied, and only then we would uh, do the um, next overall um, iteration um, of the um, of the exploration loop. The exploration feature graph um, provides um, an overview. Or, or specifies uh, how uh, the dependencies of the different um, available explorations are structured. So all in all, um, uh, we have implemented uh, six, uh, so currently implemented six different um, um, exploration features, such as the exploration of safety function architectures, um, a dedicated module to explore, explore design diversity. So to use different um, implementations of uh, safety critical components to provide uh, additional safety arguments. And then there's a hardware platform um, architecture exploration allowing to um, uh, select the uh, optimal number of um, uh, hardware resources, so ECUs for instance, then to synthesize partition architectures and uh, then while these two um, streams can be done uh, independent, they both um, um, have to be performed before then the actual mapping of the tasks um, to the platform is performed. So here we would also consider the possible replication of tasks. And uh, only after the tasks have been fully um, determined, then the scheduling uh, can be performed. And, and in our framework, not all of these features have been used um, in every scenario, but um, the user can uh, decide which features to, to turn on or off and um, uh, just uh, use um, those that are appropriate. So on this slide, um, a few more details on exploration modules um, are shown. So an exploration module um, 
as part of the implementation of a, an exploration feature. So um, it has uh, the input artifacts that are required. And then there's the actual algorithm performing the exploration and then also output artifacts um, are um, produced. And um, the nice thing is that in the framework um, implementation, this is also directly um, uh, reflected. So this is uh, on the one hand based on uh, on Google Juice um, uh, that we use yeah, to um, trace that the dependencies between the different uh, exploration features. And so um, Juice um, yeah, determines the um, execution order of the different exploration modules. So um, with a look at the time, I will maybe speed up on this slide and just uh, mention that um, the uh, architectural exploration is based um, on a um, uh, evolutionary approach where we um, yeah, start with the initial um, population and encoding of the problem and then um, operators are um, applied. And um, in order to rate uh, good candidates, um, these are uh, typically then they are decoded. And um, then an evaluation is performed in order to determine uh, the fitness of the current um, uh, solution candidates. And uh, then the, the best ones um, are, are selected. And as mentioned before, yeah, this is not um, done in one stage, but since we have uh, these different exploration modules and the exploration is done in several um, uh, stages where the same principle um, is then um, applied. So for instance, if we start um, with the um, exploration um, of the partition architecture, a partition set is created, the, the operators um, determining um, the, the partitions are working on this partition set. And then um, these intermediate results are then yeah, passed to the next stages, um, uh, for instance, to do the, um, uh, the task um, uh, exploration uh, and so on. Okay, then um, I will skip these slides about the available DSE features. I've already mentioned them uh, in the previous slide. And um, now I will switch over for a brief um, demonstration um, of um, our approach um, that um, is implemented in the um, Autofocus um, 3 tool. I'll just give you one overview slide here about Autofocus. So it's an open source tool and a research platform based on, on, the, on Eclipse. Um, you find um, also the download link um, here um, if you're interested. And um, yeah, in uh, the model-based systems engineering group in Fortis, we use this as the, um, um, uh, as the focal point of our um, research on, on model-based um, systems engineering. So, but now I will um, switch to the tool where you can uh, now see um, a model that I have already um, loaded. So this is an example of an automatic um, cruise control. And on the left-hand side, you can uh, see um, models representing the different viewpoints as I have explained before. So we have here a logical viewpoint. Um, representing the different um, uh, components. So we have an adaptive cruise control and we are combining this here with a, also an entertainment function. And as you see, um, also this model is here is hierarchical. And um, in, in this example, we have also uh, provided um, then also uh, an uh, model-based specification of the behavior um, of the system. So there are either um, code specifications um, that uh, provide the implementation in a more code-based way, but there are also um, a state automata that can be used um, to perform the, um, the specification um, of, of the behavior of the system. The second um, part of the, um, or the second uh, Input model is the platform architecture. 
So in this case, uh, we have here a um, hierarchical model um, of one ECU uh, called Node and in this um, nomenclature uh, with just a single tile, just a single multi-core and that in this simple example just um, features two different cores that are connected um, by a shared bus. And as mentioned before, there's an allocation table um, that yeah, maps the different uh, views uh, onto the system. So one is here a, a mapping of the um, logical architecture to the task architecture. So which I can also show So this is here an, um, a flat representation of, of the component architecture. And that in this simple case is just a one-to-one -one, um, mapping. Um, so for each logical component and the and, uh, logical architecture, a dedicated task has been uh, created. And in this table, we have specified then yeah, a mapping um, of uh, tasks uh, to components. Moreover, more, moreover, the task architecture also provides um, additional um, information such as um, uh, the assumed worst case execution time of these tasks. So we take this as an input um, to our experiments. So these are uh, random values and for two of the tasks, I yeah, uh, added uh, or changed them to be a bit larger so we can then um, easy, more easily identify them in, in the resulting uh, schedule. And another input, part of the input is then also timing and specification where we can uh, provide um, constraints um, on different, um, in two different ways. One is event constraints. Uh, so when uh, events are specified when different things or which different things can happen in, in the system, such as a signal is received, a signal um, is sent by a task or a task is started or a task is ended, for instance. And we could also um, use this yeah, to uh, um, actually uh, uh, define event chains that then um, allow to define a, a cons temporal constraints over a, a whole um, functional uh, chain in the system, such as an end-to-end an -end, uh, deadline. So you can also see this concept, for instance, in, in AutoSAR, where this has been proposed um, as an AutoSAR uh, Timex um, extension. Now, once um, the input model um, has been specified, um, in our tool, you can switch to a dedicated perspective that allows you to perform design space exploration. Here again, the input model um, has to be imported and um, the different architectures um, have to be selected. So data dictionary um, define, provides user-defined data types. We have the logical architecture, the task architecture, the mapping of the uh, logical components to the tasks, the platform architecture, and the timing specification. And once um, this is done, um, the next step is yet yeah, to define um, constraints and uh, and objectives. This can be done in uh, also in a dedicated editor. So for instance, we can use here some patterns such as saying that, for instance, the speed plausibilization task has to be allocated um, to core one and that um, the entertainment um, task has to be um, allocated uh, to core two. Of course, there are also um, other ways uh, to specify constraints such as function coupling, meaning that um, two tasks have to go together onto the same execution unit or decoupling that they shouldn't be. There are also constraints regarding the memory utilization, um, allowing to provide some bounds of uh, how much of a memory of a, of a certain memory uh, may be used in, in, in a valid solution. And also regarding uh, the safety level, um, namely um, the required um, uh, ACIL of, or SIL of a, of a component and the um, 
safety capability um, of, of a certain element. Now, once um, um, the constraint model um, is done, uh, in the synthesis uh, view, we can now specify yeah, which um, exploration um, to perform. And uh, here we can uh, now switch on the different exploration features. So we could, for instance, say that we first would like to do a deployment and scheduling synthesis of the system. Now I have to say that these two constraints that I have um, defined before, I have to group them into a so-called rule set because I could have here a really large number of constraints and um, this, these rule sets allow us yeah, to, to cluster them and to, also to re reuse these uh, rules later. And then we switch to the um, MUIA based backend of autofocus and then we can um, uh, run the DCE and uh, perform um, the optimization. So while um, we are waiting um, for the results, um, I can already uh, assure you that um, I will probably not take more than five minutes, um, go over five or at most 10 minutes over the time. So uh, we will then also have uh, uh, enough time uh, also for questions and also, um, the, the third session will also be probably be a bit shorter as I have confirmed with um, Jasmine um, before. And we can here maybe stop the exploration um, after maybe 20% uh, because in the evolutionary um, uh, approach, uh, we are um, running the exploration for a fixed number of explorations. And um, initial solutions are typically already found after a few iterations. And we can now just stop this at this point. And uh, we can uh, then also confirm that we are also interested in suboptimal um, solutions. And um, see them here. So for instance, we have now here um, a GAN chart um, of the system where we can see that um, the speed plausibilization is on core one and the entertainment task, which is the last one, is um, uh, has been mapped on task two. And we can also, for instance, confirm that the entertainment task um, is executed before the, um, uh, the display task. So, uh, yeah, this gives us some evidence that also the uh, data dependencies and the causality in the system um, has been considered uh, correctly. So I will now start um, a second synthesis, um, uh, doing a deployment and a um, partition synthesis uh, combined with a scheduling synthesis. So this means that we uh, now we would also like to include um, the possibility to use hypervisor partitions in such a synthesis. We'll again use our rule set and run the optimization. And while um, this is computing in the background, this takes a bit longer, I will switch again um, um, to the presentation. Skipping the next uh, three slides, it just gives you some um, hints about uh, what can be done in the uh, exploration uh, perspective for your later reference. So we saw the modeling of the constraints and the objective. We saw a bit uh, how um, artifacts of the platform deployment and schedules can be, can be um, synthesized, um, referring to constraints and uh, grouping them into uh, rule sets and uh, also showed you um, that results can be visualized. So we already saw the schedule view. So we have some representation, some screenshots here for your later reference. And um, before looking um, at the at the outcome of the of this final part of the demonstration, I would like to give you some uh, take home message and outlook. Namely, uh, that we saw that uh, model-based systems engineering 
helps us here yeah, to define uh, and structure the development on, um, of complex embedded systems and that the um, abstraction introduced by the models um, enable us to um, mitigate the complexity of these systems and to perform um, design um, automation with the um, ultimate um, goal yet yeah, to also reuse um, development artifacts um, for instance by yeah, mapping a logical architecture to different platforms or synthesizing um, uh, new platforms um, semi-automatically for instance and um, by this means to uncover the underlying um, design space um, of the system. Our approach um, is a dependency driven um, design space exploration that is uh, reusable and extensible by means of so-called um, exploration features and uh, so the exploration can be um, adapted both by the user of such an exploration as I just showed you uh, in, the, in the brief tool demo but also by developers of exploration modules um, by means um, of this Google Juice uh, and dependency injection based implementation. So now finally um, I will have a look um, at our demo again and we saw that unfortunately I'm sorry about this uh, the demo effect um, has happened and uh, there was obviously um, a problem so um, we will stop this now. So we would have seen the exploration also of a partition architecture, but we can maybe, now we will stop this now. Uh, we would also have seen that the um, um, resulting um, uh, artifacts can also be then exported again and then also be um, yeah, used in, in, in the further development. So we would have exported the partition architecture into the model navigator and then the engineer could have taken up from there uh, manually. So this brings me um, to the end of my presentation and um, uh, I'm happy here yeah, to about your questions or comments um, that you might have. Okay, the uh, first question is the, if there's a tutorial um, on autofocus. Um, there I would refer you um, uh, to um, the autofocus homepage um, where there's a, uh, on the one hand, a, a large user manual um, that also provides examples. And there's also um, a section with uh, video based tutorials also on, on our homepage. So you can uh, see it here uh, in this link. And you can also switch this uh, to English. Sorry, this is the, the German link. So do you have uh, any further questions or comments? So in case, if this isn't the case, I would uh, point you at some references if you're interested uh, on, in the other underlying um, technical details um, uh, of what I have presented. And then, uh, hand over um, uh, to Jasmine again, uh, who will continue um, with the third session uh, then at uh, 12 o'clock uh, Central European time. Thank you for your interest in this presentation. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, great. Let me just try to share my screen. Okay, so we will make a short break um, between these sessions. So I just have a time to take a quick break and then uh, we will continue in 12.05. So you have time to refresh and then we will 
continue with the final and the third part.
Okay, uh, can you hear me now? If you could just write in the chat if you can hear me now. Okay, great. Uh, so welcome to the third part. I hope you can see my screen now or also in the, the full screen. If you can confirm that as well, that you can see the full screen. Okay, great. So that's great. And now I think we have avoid that annoying overlapping screen. So welcome to the third part of uh, this tutorial. In this part, we'll be mostly focusing on the code aspects on general issues with threading. And we will have a couple of polls where you can enter your own, uh, own challenges with the threads. Okay, so what we really want to discuss is the general issue with, uh, with the threads. We will discuss, be discussing some synchronization mechanisms and uh, some logical problems in code, not so much the code syntax, uh, concurrency bugs in, in that context. And we'll be also discussing how can one find concurrency bugs and test multi-threaded software. So in the, in the first part, what we were discussing are those six cases, six uh, instances of the template. And the sixth one was interesting because in the sixth one, we had dependencies between the threads. So we would take a task, we would partition it into the threads, and then there would be some dependencies between these threads. And then we said that in order, if we want to go with this scenario further, we need to make drivers for liveness, for concurrency bugs, for the synchronization. And also we need to make decisions in order how to ensure the correctness of such software. So that's the starting point from which we are going to take off in discussing of this part of the tutorial. We have said, we have seen also that if we, if we have threads, so that means if you take a task, it partitions into your threads, and these threads are executing concurrently, and there are dependencies between them. If they are not synchronized properly, we will have concurrency bugs. Besides the concurrency bugs, there are other issues in, in this domain. And the other issues include the influence of the synchronization mechanisms on execution time. That's something that we're going to see a bit later. Now, before we proceed, I would like to start a very quick poll. Let's just see if this will work. Uh, oops. Start a very quick poll about, okay. Okay, if you could then just take a, in, in the following minute, just try to answer this question meaning uh, including your uh, including our, considering your applications, do you have all your applications multi-threaded predominantly, non, rarely? Twenty more seconds to go. Ten. Okay, great. Uh, just before I proceed with the explaining uh, and discussing the results of the poll, uh, just a question: Can you see the results of the poll on, on my screen? Okay, that's interesting. Okay, uh, nevertheless, then I will just comment them like this. Uh, so what we had is that uh, uh, majority of the people said that uh, this part of the applications are multi-threaded. Uh, some of them said that uh, applications are, all applications are multi-threaded. And uh, there is a large number of people who said that uh, applications are predominantly multi-threaded okay you cannot see anything so it's really acting strange but 
let's see now what we can okay uh, I hope now it's better you can see the presentation uh, just for person so that means 70 percent said that they never work with the uh, multi-thread applications and uh, 13 percent said that they are working rarely with the uh, multi-thread applications i hope these results will be later available so we can share them okay okay that's mm, can you see them now the results Okay, great. So you have the, the, the overview. Okay, now I know how to do it. Okay, then let's uh, let's proceed. So you, you have the, the impression that most of the people are working or using multi-thread applications in, in, in their software. That's good. So let's remove this. Okay, so general, what is really the, the issue with the thread? So why not everyone are just by default using all the multi-threaded applications? So why are we not by default using this potential of hardware in terms of the concurrent processing? Well, in 2006, so just around the time of the, Denar, of the break of the Denar scaling, there was a paper by Edward Lee. It's called The Problem with Threads. So Edward Lee, among other things, he discusses and uh, argues that the hum human beings execute actions concurrently. So we are inherently doing something concurrently. So I'm talking and uh, looking currently at, at my slides and following the chat, uh, you perhaps uh, looking at the slides and hopefully not doing too much other things in parallel. But the point is we are as human beings used to, to the concurrency. So how come that we cannot handle this concurrency in the multi-threading? Obviously, it's not so widely adopted, and we're still struggling it. And his arg uh, argument was that um, I will just read the quote. So they, the, the, the threads, discard the most essential and uh, appealing properties of sequential computation: understandability, predictability, and non-determinism. And, and determinism. And also, he says uh, non-determinism should be explicitly introduced where needed, rather than removed were not needed. So what were the uh, original thoughts behind uh, this, these conclusions? Uh, he said the following. So let's say that there are two programs, P and P prime, and they are executing the same functionality. So if we have the same initial states, uh, for such initial states, the final states of these two programs will be the same. So something that we would expect. And these two programs are sequential. Now let's take two programs, P1 and P2, and they execute concurrently. And let's take uh, their other instances, P1 prime and P2 prime, where P1 prime executes the same functionality as P1 and P2 prime executes the same functionality as the uh, P2, and let's execute them. Uh, in which case are they equivalent? They are equivalent if they have this, so that means they will end up in the in the same uh, state well for, in order to compare the, the the equivalence between these two they need to have the same initial states it's also necessary to reason about all possible interleavings and not also only about all possible interleavings of their operations because we saw that interleavings of the operations are critical we saw the example of the concurrency bug so they both had the same input state but just the interleaving of the operations led to the bug there is also a bonus so not only that we need to know about these two programs or threads, we also need to know about all the other threads which are running concurrently with them. So in terms of the complexity, the number of the possible interleavings is on two on power of n multiplied with i, where n is the number of threads and the i is the number uh, total number of the instructions. So this is really exponential complexity and uh, we, we have a problem dealing, dealing with this. So that's one of the problems of threads that was discussed in 2006. Now, from the architectural point of view, what we usually try to do is to capture good architectural practices and bad architectural practices. Good architectural practices usually call patterns. 
so patterns of the design that we notice during the design that they're useful for sol solving certain, for example, quality issues. And we try to document them and reuse them when the problem occurs in the same context. Anti-patterns or so-called bad smells, sometimes also called as a techn technical tab, are usually something that we are trying to avoid. And um, there is an excellent paper about determining what is actually pattern and anti-pattern in your organization. But there are several templates for these anti-patterns, which always need to be applied in the concrete context. But uh, some of them include, for example, dependencies. So uh, one says that unstable dependencies are an anti-pattern. So if one component or subsystem depends on the other one, uh, which is less stable, and if there is a change, there is so-called ripple effect. Ripple effect means that if you change something in one place in your code or a system, you have to change it in several more times. So basic in several uh, more places because the change propagates. So that's the ripple effect. So there is also an anti-pattern of cycle dependencies. So two subsystems or uh, components are mutually dependent on each other. There is also an anti-pattern of the uh, hotspots. So for example, the cross-module dependencies or cross-module cycle dependencies and so on and so on. In general, more dependencies we have between the components or the subsystems, it's considered that we are closer towards the, an anti-pattern of a design. So using this logic, uh, what we did in our research is we were trying to observe these multi-threads from the architecture point of view. So when we talk about architecture point of view, just uh, what we usually aim to achieve is to have, have a high cohesion and to have a low coupling. So I will not discuss cohesion in this context, let's just discuss coupling. What does it mean to have a coupling between functions, components, classes, objects, and so on? Well, there could be different uh, types of the coupling. So it can be data coupling, where if you change something in uh, one file component or whatever, it needs to be automatically changed in another one. Otherwise, we are losing the consistency or the data is not correct. Uh, control coupling, where execution of one depends on the other temporal coupling and so on and so on. The point with the coupling is usually that if you want to change something in your component or if you need to know how the other components are working and how other components are using your component. And also, if you want to use another component, you need to know how internally that component works. So this is, as you can see, a really bad because at least in the object-oriented programming or in any uh, type of programming or software engineering where we have self-contained components, what we want to do is to have these clean interfaces between the components. So this is, as you can see, already an anti-pattern. Now, the question is, how is this connected with the multi-threaded software? Well, in multi-threaded software, what we have is the situation when there are no interfaces, when threads are accessing shared memory. So at any point, any developer can decide that a certain thread is accessing, should access shared memory, and any developer can change the way in which its thread is accessing shared memory. That means a developer can say, okay, I want to access a certain variable, or I'm already accessing a certain variable using a lock, L1. Now I'm going to use another lock for some reason, mistake or some design decision, doesn't matter. The point is that the consequence of such a decision is that all other threads are affected. So or adult, all other threads are completely unaware that someone is accessing shared variable with different synchronization or without synchronization, but their correctness is immediately affected. So in order to properly synchronize the access to shared, me uh, to shared memory between the threads and to make sure that uh, uh, the changes that the thread is introducing are going to function correctly, all other threads need to know and understand internal implementation of each other. And this is a very definition of a high coupling. So basically, the design of the multi-thread application, that was our conclusion and why it's so hard, the design of the multi-thread applications is anti-pattern in itself. And it only gets worse because if we want to discover dependencies between the threads, how are we going to do that? Or if we want to discover what are the synchronization mechanisms that threads are using to access shared memory, how are we going to do that? We have to have some sort of the analysis. We'll get to that later. The point is, it's really hard to find concurrency bugs 
because we need to reconstruct these dependencies in the shared memory between the threads. Now, uh, for a quick second poll, I will just ask you for one more minute. Okay. Okay, I hope you can see now the, the poll on the screen. And in the next minute, uh, to answer what are the most important issues that you perceive when it comes to multi-threading, whether it's this non-determinism or how to partition software into threads, how to develop this type of the applications, the reasoning was going to be a speed up, how to coordinate development if you have a team or none the above. In which case, please talk to me because I'm interested what kind of issues do you have. Okay, 20 seconds to go. And we are done. So thank you for your input. I hope now you can see the results. So it's obvious that it's an embedded community because most of the people have a problem with the worst case execution time, but also how to partition the threads, how to develop such thing, uh, reasoning what would speed up, how to test such software. Yes, this is a really big problem. What I'm surprised is that uh, only 10% have an issue how to develop that software in a team, but okay, that's, that's interesting. Okay, uh, thank you for, for your input. So let's proceed further. Okay, so we have concluded here that uh, at least from our perspective, the problem is that uh, multi-threading has this anti-pattern of dependencies in it by design. Now, in order to synchronize access to the shared resources, what we are using are synchronization mechanisms. So I would try to, I don't know if you can see them. Okay, now that's a bit bigger. Uh, what kind of synchronization mechanisms we, we can use. So it's possible to use, for example, locks, in which case one thread will block if uh, another one is using the shared resources. So we have a, a sequential execution of the operations, but as a consequence, we have a problem with the blocking. So one thread has to wait a barrier. So that means that there are uh, certain places in code uh, which contain barriers and only after all threads reach their barriers in the code the execution can proceed inter-thread synchronization uh, monitors i will not detail this uh, here i will not go with this into the details now again a very quick uh, poll for you So what kind of synchronization mechanisms you usually use? So again, we have one minute. <clears throat> okay, uh, we have, <clears throat> sorry, we have the results. Uh, predominant, <clears throat> uh, sorry, pick some water. Uh, predominant are the locks and uh, also the scheduling, which again, okay, I, I understand it reflects the, the community. 
<coughs> sorry. So the the point with the <coughs> with the synchronization is that uh, although they're solving the problem, and they're also influencing other uh, other properties of the of the system. We'll see later how. Okay. Uh, when it comes to the scheduling via uh, uh, when it comes to synchronization via scheduling, uh, it was introduced already in the second part. This LET scheduling. So I'll go into the details uh, over there. Uh, so the point is that uh, each thread has a certain time uh, for which is predicted is going to execute, and if it executes uh, before that, it, that time will be wasted. So we have some sort of the underutilization, but it gives a certain guarantee in terms of uh, how much time a certain uh, thread will take to execute. So it's possible to create synchronization by using these times. What is more important is that uh, besides this blocking synchronization and locks, there is also non-blocking synchronization. Now, this is a very tempting uh, way for synchronization because it removes this idea of the non-determinism source that the blocking synchronization introduces. Because if there are blocks and if there are, for example, barriers or anything which is blocking the execution, we have additional source of the non-determinism in our system. Non-blocking synchronization, synchronization removes this by usually using these operations, uh, which, which are there to uh, make sure that they execute in a single cycle and using them and using a complex data structure, it's possible to create non-blocking synchronization. However, this, no, this does not come without the issues. So we have uh, did certain uh, number of experiments. I hope now you can see this, okay. Okay, so uh, here we have uh, two very simple examples, uh, multiple producer, multiple consumer, and single producer, single consumer. And we have used uh, synchronization mechanisms from a, a Boost library and uh, from the SCD, which is the, mut the mutex. So quite interesting results, very simple examples. Uh, you can find the code uh, here and you can find the, the results of the whole paper here. But the point is, and that in one case, the uh, lock-based synchronization was able to out outperform the lock-free synchronization, where in the case of the single producer, single consumer, lock-based synchronization was slower than the lock-free synchronization. So it really depends on the use case scenario uh, where we are using synchronization. So what kind of pattern threads have when it comes to the accessing to the shared memory? So although it avoids the uh, important aspect of uh, blocking each, uh, each other, blocking other threads, it can also have a disadvantage, the lock-free synchronization, that it's sometimes slower than the lock-space synchronization. Okay, now when it comes to the concurrency bugs, we have already uh, seen the most simple concurrency bugs, which is a data race. Besides the data race, there are unfortunately many other types of the concurrency bugs, and one of them are called atomicity violations. So I will try to illustrate this atomicity violation uh, on an example. Here we have an example, two threads. They are executing some operations. They are executing operations on a shared object called object. So one thread creates an object and after some time it wants to call a method on it. All accesses are properly synchronized. In the, in the between, uh, another thread is initializing this object with a new value. So it's initializing it with the value now. So once this second, once this first thread calls a method, we will have a null pointer exception. So if we consider it from the data race point of view, there are no data races here because all accesses are synchronized. However, the issue here is the atomicity violation assumption. So whoever programmed this first part has assumed that no other operation, no other critical operation, which could introduce a bug, will happen between these two locks. What would have to happen in order to have this code uh, properly synchronized, we would have to have locks starting here and ending here. But uh, this is something that uh, would be properly to do, but in this case, what we had is a wrong assumption about the atomicity. So, that's another type of the, of the concurrency bugs. Uh, other type of the concurrency bugs, I would not like to go into the details. They're usually related to the synchronization mechanisms which are used. So for example, if we have improper use of the synchronization mechanisms, then we might have a bug such as, uh, such as data locks. 
as such as the deadlock, sorry. Uh, there is also one very interesting type of uh, concurrency bugs, which is not actually concurrency bugs, but in the terms that it originates on a shared memory. It reflects itself on a shared memory. It's a type of the bug that originates because of the shared memory. So let's observe this example here. Uh, thread one and thread two, they execute. They're accessing a shared variable A. And in the first case, the thread says, okay, if A is not equal to 10, then B is nine. And after some time, this thread says, okay, if A is equal to 10, then C is equal one divided B minus nine. So if you just observe this thread, the situation where B is equal to nine and this is executed would never happen. Because if this, that would be the case, then we would have division by zero, which is a bug. So from this perspective, it's either this or this code which will execute. However, if we have another thread, which is changing a shade variable, and then a condition depends on that shade variable, this execution where both cases are executed is actually possible. So we do not have explicitly incorrect results in the shade memory. We have correct results in the shade memory. We just have a path that no one considered before until the concurrent execution. So that's a big. That's also one big problem with the with the concurrency bugs. Again, a very short poll for you when it comes to the concurrency bugs. So what I'm interested in is to understanding uh, what kind of concurrency bugs did you face so far in your in your development life or testing life. I hope you can now see the the questions. Okay, 15 seconds left. And we are done. So let's share the results. So data races remain the predominant concurrency bug. New experience, then deadlocks. I hope you're not facing something which you still cannot explain. So that can also be a on part of the issue, the people have bugs, but they're not really sure what those bugs are. Okay, uh, thank you for that input and we will continue further. So what is the, the point in uh, synchronization as a, as a design decision and how this relates to embedded systems? Well, first of all, it relates to the idea that if we choose a synchronization, it cannot affect, or we hope it will not affect our execution time in the terms that it leads to underutilization of our harder resources. Because that is again related to the price and uh, let me just remove this. And that uh, can have a negative uh, implications in that context. The next thing is if we have synchronization, for example, locks, it can have a negative effect on predicting worst case execution time because it introduces a new source of the non-determinism. We never know for how long one thread will wait for another. And that's a big problem in predicting worst execution time. But most of all, how to find concurrency bugs. So how to find the places where threads are accessing chain memory, but they are not using synchronization mechanisms or they're using synchronization mechanisms in an improper way leading to bugs such as such are deadlocks. So this is really a big question. And the problem is that the execution of the threads, as we have seen, is non-deterministic in terms of their progress. So we never know which operations will overlap. So reproducing certain bugs and their behavior, it's really hard. So how do we find concurrency bugs? Well, what we are actually looking for is the violation of these assumptions about the atomicity. In the finer grade terms, we need to find the memory which is shared between the threads, what kind of synchronization mechanisms they're using, and we somehow have to guess what are developers' intention. 
In that context, there are several approaches to go with this problem, static analysis. Static analysis is great because it can potentially find old bugs that exist in our code. The drawbacks of the static analysis are usually scalability, so it doesn't scale with big problems, and sometimes it reports too many false positives. That means false warnings, in which case people spend more time trying to reason whether a reported bug is indeed a bug or reported bug is a false positive. Then they, uh, then they spend by fixing the real bugs. Another approach is dynamic analysis. That usually means there is a software, it's executed, we trace execution of the software, that, mean to, that means to which memory location, which thread is accessing, and what kind of shared, uh, what kind of synchronization mechanisms that thread is using. And then on that execution trace, we apply some algorithm, there are several of them, and then try to reason with whether there has been a concurrency bug or not. Uh, we can also rely on the regular testing, and that means uh, execute, for example, unit tests uh, of, of several threads and try to see whether the result is incorrect. But the problem is usually what we can do here is to change the input data, sometimes maybe try to introduce some delays. Uh, even if you find a bug, it's really hard to reproduce them. And the model checking, model checking basically means creating the whole, the model of a system, running a checker on top of it and uh, finding which invariants about the system do not hold. Very good because it can find the uh, counterexamples, but often has a problem with the, with the scalability. So in our context, we will just be discussing briefly the idea of the dynamic monitoring or the dynamic analysis. So in order to actually apply this approach, it's much more complex than uh, just this diagram. So what do we actually need in the case of the uh, dynamic analysis? We need to select the test cases. We need to run those test cases on our software. We need to uh, trace the execution of our software and get the execution trace back. On that execution trace, we need to apply an algorithm for finding concurrency bugs. And that algorithm needs cons to consider the following. It needs to consider the models of different concurrency bugs. So I hope you can see it now, oh, yeah, okay. It needs to consider different models of the synchronization primitives. It needs to try and consider synchronization intentions of developers. If possible, it should also quantify the coverage. So we know how much did we test because analysis, static analysis is about proving the absence of the bugs and the testing is about finding the bugs or proving the presence of the bugs in our software. So what we need in the end is some report of concurrency bugs and for what portion of the code that report is valid. So that means quantification of the, of the coverage. Okay. so. When it comes to any tool that is trying to find concurrency bugs, there are three parameters which are important for the end users. And those are precision of that tool, performance of that tool, how long does it take, how much memory does it take, and so on, and the coverage. So that means how uh, quantification, how much of the uh, software did that tool cover. So we'll be mostly discussing the, the precision in that case. So if we have any tool, which is trying to find concurrency bugs, which is based on dynamic analysis. Here are the important parameters of the precision. First of all, these are false positives and false negatives. False positives are false warnings. False negatives are bugs which exist in our software, but the tool was not able to recognize them. And these primarily depend on the test cases. So if a test case is not able to exercise certain execution path, then all the bugs on that path will not be detected by a tool. It's also depending on the execution tracing. Some execution tracing techniques are changing dynamic behavior of the software under test. So they can either introduce a new bugs, which do not exist really in the original software, or what they can also do is to mask some of the bugs. That means that the analysis will not be able to get the execution trace, which matches the original software under test. Uh, when it comes to the coverage, coverage also depends on the test cases which are executed, and it also depends on the execution tracing because, uh, again, some of the paths because of the tracing might not be executed as they would be originally executed. And it also depends on the extracting of the static software structure because when we execute software and we get execution trace, we need to compare it against something to see what 
percentage of that something that means static structure is covered. Okay, now when it comes to the coverage, there are two questions that uh, needs to be answered. The first one is the coverage of the uh, of the control flow. So that means that in our software, we can have logical decisions, which contain logical conditions, which are related with logical operators. So for example, uh, this is a this is an example of logical condition, logical uh, operators, and or and so on, and they all form a logical decision. I will not go into details what are the techniques for uh, coverage, but there are certain coverage coverage criteria which are quantified, and if we are able to prove them with our tests, this it's generally considered that they sort of guarantee certain quality of software. Not uh, hundred percent sure, but it's generally accepted that they guarantee certain qualities. So for example, statement that every statement is ex executed, coverage, a condition that every condition in code is ex uh, evaluated at least one to true and false, decision that uh, every condition in a decision is evaluated to true and false, and that the, every decision is evaluated to true and false at least once. MCDC coverage, all of this, but also a combination of the conditions where it's shown that if we keep all conditions stable, so constant, and if we just take one condition and change it from true or false or true, from false to true, that it's shown that this single change changes the outcome of the whole decision. So plus those, those quantifications. And there are relatively uh, few approaches which are trying to reason how to quantify the coverage of our sequential code. The problem is what's happening with the interleavings. How can we claim what, how many interleavings did we cover? And when it comes to that, there are some approaches, but nothing really practical. Two of the most common approaches are that the approach is either introducing some random delays in the execution and hoping to hit some critical interleaving or that there is analysis. After the analysis, there is identification of the critical interleavings and then introducing delays in order to force them. Now, if you have the number of the interleavings two on the power of n multiplied with i, number of threads is n, i is the number of the instructions. It's a huge design space and a huge test space. Okay, so um, one of the most used algorithms for finding concurrency bugs it's so-called eraser lockset algorithm. I will just try to quickly summarize what does eraser trying to do. There are others, there's for example, there's for example algorithms based on happens before idea. So eraser analyzes set of the execution trace. And then for each memory access, it saves that memory access into a list of the all variables. For each uh, lock, so lock acquire, lock release, it updates a currently held lock set for each thread. How this algorithm works? So it analyzes this trace. When it finds a memory access, it goes into the list of the all variables. And if it finds that variable already in the list, it updates its, its state according to this diagram that I will not, not explain. If it, finds, um, if it finds a lock acquire or lock release, it updates currently held locks of each thread, which is acquiring or releasing the lock. If it finds a memory access to a variable, which is in the state shared or shared modified, then it's doing the following. It's making intersection between something which is called candidate set of each variable with the currently held locks of the thread, which is accessing that variable. Now, currently held locks, I have explained whenever thread acquires a lock, it goes there. Whenever thread releases a lock, it's removed from that set. What is candidate set? Candidate set of the locks is set of all locks at the beginning, which can exist in the system. And every variable, which is in the state shared or shared modified at the beginning has candidate set equal to all locks, which can exist in the system on every access to the shared and shared modified variable, these two are intersected and the result of that intersection is saved here. If the result of the intersection is an empty set, that means there is a potential concurrency bug because what does it mean? 
it means that the thread is already uh, is either accessing a variable without using any or so it's currently a locks set is empty and then when there is intersection that is also empty or that two threads have been accessing shared variable using different locks so for example using lock one and then intersection that means that the new candidate set has lock one and then thread two is using lock two then intersection between these two is an empty set so that's how lock set algorithm is finding congruency bugs so just a short overview i would recommend that you read original paper okay now back to the atomicity violation and the issues with that so if we consider this we have said that in this case there is a bug, but from the perspective of the locking, everything seems to be working well. So if we would apply a lock set algorithm in its original state, lock set algorithm would conclude, okay, all access to the shared memory are properly synchronized. There is no issue. It gets even more complicated because this pattern and this pattern are the same. But in this case, this is really a proper synchronization. So at one point, thread is updating the account by removing certain amount and again by removing certain amount and here by adding some amount. So why not? This works. There is a thread for uh, withdrawing money from your account. There is a thread for adding money to your account. Both are synchronized properly. This works quite well. So there is a quite a lot of research in this uh, atomistic violation. And here is one of the really good papers on this topic. I will not go into the details how to deal with this. Now, when it comes to um, lock and lock based lock free and lock based synchronization there is another issue so locking synchronization is bad because of the potential issues that it has with worst case execution time and in general with the underutilization of the hardware resources but also the we the good part is that there are a lot of tools which are trying to find lock based synchronization lock free synchronization has potentially many benefits, but the issue is how do we find if, so for example, our software is using log pre synchronization, how do we find if that synchronization is implemented correctly? So we did some experiments. So we applied Helgrin tool and thread sanitizer and regularly when it comes to the log free synchronization, they were not in all cases, but in some cases, well, in most of the cases, they were uh, either reporting too many false positives. So in this case more than a uh, thousand false positives depending on uh, execution. So we, we run around a thousand executions. Or in some cases, for example, Halgorin would simply crash uh, for some uh, uh, type of the synchronization because it could not handle them at all. So it's really hard if we have lock free synchronization to find a tool which enables you to test this type of the software. So in general, the challenges here are how to find what are the shared memory states between the threads and what is the synchronization which is used so we have some sort of the analysis which we can try and use and find but the problem here really which remains unanswered is how to detect synchronization intentions that developers and engineers have based on threads one way is to use for example annotations but the problem is if someone made a mistake in code the same person can make mistake in the annotations if someone has a forgot to maintain properly the code someone might also forget to maintain properly the annotations even worse because there are for example no automatic checks so we did some work in this area in specifying these intentions on the architecture level and then using them to verify the code but still a lot more work needs to be done especially targeting different granularities so when it comes to the tool for finding concurrency bugs, there are many approaches. Most of these approaches claim to have their own tools. What is really available? Well, very few. So some of the most famous are Helgrind and the Thread Sanitizer. There are also uh, tools such as Pin and the Dino Mario, which are just tracing the execution. And then people usually build their own tools, in-house tools based on uh, what uh, based on the analysis of, analysis of these trades these uh, tools are are providing but in general it's it's really hard to uh, find a good tool for finding concurrency bugs uh, in the cooperation with a um, student uh, from Siemens who did his master thesis in in this area 
we have made the one summary of the issues that the existing tools have in the industry software. So this usually means that it's necessary to change C make files, make files, that's necessary to change a certain compiler, which you're going to use if you want to have, to have a tool that works. Some tools were just limited to the 64 bits. Um, most of the this tracing was intrusive, so it disturbed the dynamic behavior of the software. There would be false positive in most of them. Most of them did not report the coverage. So there is a gap between what the industry really wants in terms of the tools and what is currently offered by vendors or what is currently offered by uh, the prototypes in the academia. Uh, we are we will be packaging these results into into a paper. So, so so hopefully soon you will be able to read about it. So I would start just one more survey. In terms of what kind of tools do you use in order to find concurrency bugs? So I hope you can see now the poll. Okay, we already have a lot of non replies. Okay, 30 more seconds to go. <clears throat> So far, the dominant answer is not. I will share with you. Five seconds to go. Okay, and we are done. So really interesting results, although these bugs can be really critical and there were cases such as, for example, Terra 25, where currency bugs caused issues and uh, led to the loss of human lives. Most of the people unfortunately don't use any tool and I completely understand that because there is really a lack of uh, good tools that can easily integrate into software development, but still an interesting result. I hope you can uh, see the results now. Uh, something else, so Helgrin seems to be used, threat sanitizer, it's usually used by Google. I'm surprised that uh, it's not widely used. Uh, in-house tools, I would assume. Okay, quite quite interesting results. Thank you for, for sharing that. So uh, this is just a quick overview of what we have been doing in this tutorial. So we started with the idea that uh, we want to use multi-cores and concurrency in order to fulfill some of our drivers, usually related to performance. From this, we have collected several additional supporting requirements and the drivers and we may we try to make decisions for them now for these decisions there are several approaches which are trying to evaluate whether these decisions were adequate for the drivers now i will not go through this i will just leave you a reference so for example there is a spot analysis there is a atam something as a standard approach in this area and there are also those approaches, for example, rate, which is based on the ATM or the Atom and which is tailored specifically for industry with specific recommendations, how to do, how to do the architecture adequacy check in terms of the solutions to verify whether your decisions are adequate for your drivers. Okay, we are back to this annoying. Okay, so uh, I would start to wrap up at, at this point and uh, leave some time for discussion. So to conclude, basically, we started from those drivers, as I have said, so mostly focusing on the execution time. What was initially a very or relatively simple driver, so we want to somehow improve our execution time of our software. As we saw as the things develop, as we have to consider more and more things, and we have to, if you're going to use concurrency and multi-threading, the number of the requirements and then the number of, number of the drivers is just growing and growing. So when someone makes a decision to use the multi-cores and concurrency, it really needs to consider many other requirements, many other drivers, and it needs to make many other decisions. So it's not just one decision about this. 
because there are so many of these requirements and because there are many so, so many of these drivers the question is whether the decisions are adequate well the first part of the problem i would say is who makes the decision whether it's an architect who can predict what would be the uh, potential implications to our decisions or you're going to let the developers to make the decision and hope for the best the point here is even when we um, create these design decisions properly from the architecture point of view the question is how to code them properly and the second thing is once we code that how can we test if the coding was successful without compromising the correctness of our software so it's really hard to do this properly but uh, it's one of the ways of using the hardware that we have for increasing our performance if you have certain ideas how to expand this if you have a certain feedback uh, if you would like to cooperate on some interesting problems please let us know here are our, our emails and i would like to thank you thank you for your attention and i'm here for your questions we are here for your questions sorry Simon. <clears throat> So any feedback, any questions? I know that you are alive because of the polls, so that's certain. So there is one question. Uh, is there much hope for better concurrency design in the future? Uh, I have some comments I'll first ask. Simon, do you, would you like to comment on this? Well, yes and no. Um, I mean, uh, our talks were at uh, different levels of granularity, but this was uh, intended. So they, they were um, orthogonal aspects covered. And I think with um, model-based uh, engineering, you can cover up to a certain um, amount here yeah, to, to design your high-level architecture in a way that we could avoid some of these problems also. But ultimately, when you really go then for the, the hardware-related um, implementation of a feature of a software, then you will have to deal um, yeah, with, with, with these aspects. So I would then also give back the question to you again, Jasmine, uh, uh, to provide your uh, opinion if there's uh, a lot of hope. Sure. So from the design perspective and from the coding perspective, we can theoretically do all of this properly. The problem is it's really hard to do it properly. Now, if it's really hard to do it properly, that means that the efficiency of in producing such software and such software systems then is going to be very low because after some time, our cognitive capabilities are simply overwhelmed. So we cannot produce concurrent multi-threaded software efficiently as we would like without compromising correctness. Now, one way to go is to have a, frameworks which are going to abstract this complexity and enable partial hiding of this complexity behind them and that could increase our productivity that could remove by design many of these bugs which originate so in c++ standards there are already really nice libraries which enable you to use their thread libraries much easier this is just a start but okay from that perspective there is hope the challenge is whether this is the solution for embedded systems because any abstraction that we add also means less control for what's going to happen under the hood so if we don't know what's going to happen below these frameworks and how these frameworks are going to interact and uh, what will be compiled and what will be the optimization so how this will affect our worst case execution time then it's really hard to use it for the systems that need worst case execution time guarantees and uh, that's from the coding and design perspective. There is additional problem which we didn't discuss, but it's in the slides. Uh, that's the problem of the dark silicon. So as we are getting more and more uh, transistors on a chip, 
it seems that we cannot power them on at the same time. So we can only power certain parts of the chip because otherwise if we power them all, the chip would burn even if it runs at the lower frequency than it used to. That means that we're moving into this direction of the specialized accelerators. But again, if we go in the direction of the specialized accelerators, developers need to know about the hardware. And if they need to know about the hardware, that's going to reduce their productivity. So it's uh, currently the discussion in the community is that this is the golden age of the uh, computer architecture because we're really creating new concepts and not 100% sure how this will develop. But these are just uh, some boundaries among which we are, we are dancing. Yeah, there's also a, a follow-up question. Um, so if we, that we currently observe a pattern that um, concurrency um, in software is divided, um, although it would be, uh, would result into underutilization. And the question was now if we would expect that the top-down um, MBSE uh, would uh, help uh, to solve this via, for instance, code generation. Here, uh, I think, yes, um, this is your know, one potential uh, way of addressing this, because um, uh, if we, uh, we encode also our knowledge about the platform and also the guarantees um, uh, by uh, using some of the um, uh, concurrency um, safeguarding mechanisms that, that we have discussed, then you can also build, for instance, your um, safety argumentation uh, based on your knowledge, both about the application um, and the platform. And so um, I think um, that uh, MBC is you know, one potential way of uh, keeping um, yeah, these two worlds then uh, in sync. Okay, and I would comment on this second question. So in your opinion, what should be the most efficient, safer, predictable approach, better serial codes in each core, better implemented and easy to monitor or concurrent codes with all the problems associated? Uh, my comment on this and the whole message of the tutorial is if you want to use multi-course and multi-threading, you have to know what you're doing. If you don't know what all the problems are associated with that, don't, because probably it will not give you any advantage and it will only give you headache and problems. So it's a really big design decision in order to switch to multi-course. Now, if you know what you're doing, then you have to really do the proper analysis in which cases you will be hurt by multi-course and in which cases it will give you the benefit and then do the benefit and the uh, disadvantage uh, analysis. So pros and cons analysis, uh, what you're getting and what you're missing with the multi-course and only if it makes sense, then use it. Because unfortunately, although we are stuck with this problem since 2006 and even before many of the concepts originating even before from the eighties and so on, even some of them even further, we saw 19, 1967, the paper from Andal, uh, we still did not create a good infrastructure for efficiently developing multi-threaded applications. And there are just too many problems once you go there. It's really, uh, someone called it a wild west. So you have to be very careful what you're aiming for. And you know you have to know what are the potential requirements that might come along. So that's what we discussed also in this one. Okay, there's now a, a follow-up question. Um, so which architectural decisions are the top candidates of benefiting from trace analysis uh, and platform models in an MBSE approach? Well, I think it, it really depends. So um, one um, decision that we have uh, we are quite evaluated quite successfully is uh, uh, realizing, for instance, separation constraints of, of 
for safety critical and, and non-critical software um, based on information um, that is contained um, in a platform model um, yeah, to reason about um, fault containment units on the one hand side and on the other hand also about um, yeah, coarse-grained um, information about um, interference bounds um, as far um, as you can as you can give them. Um, so I think this would be um, so the, the um, mixed criticality integration and the um, uh, the question how to deploy um, uh, software onto a target system is something that could um, from at least from my point of view certainly benefit um, uh, from uh, the proposed uh, solutions. Maybe Jasmine you have also some remarks regarding the uh, not much, just maybe regarding tracing, uh, one has to be very careful, careful with tracing because most of the approaches today for tracing are based on um, binary instrumentation. That means changing the binary under the trace. So getting the trace out of those binaries usually means getting the information about the software and those information is not, are not really the same uh, or sometimes even much different than the original software. Now there are approaches based on uh, hardware and the simulators, which are able to do this non-intrusively, but uh, be careful what you're doing. All right, there's now another follow-up comment, uh, but I don't understand what is the question here. A software partitioning allocation is a good candidate, but not always. Um, of course, it depends on your, on your application. Um, whether your software can be partitioned at all. Um, uh, however, um, we should also consider the case that um, multiple um, applications are integrated onto the same systems. Uh, in for instance, if you think of a car where you have uh, numerous uh, software defined functions. And so I think here the, the partitioning, which is of course a very um, challenging task in its own is maybe not required because you can do the uh, integration on the, on the uh, subsystem or the component level that um, uh, already originates from the um, from the different um, uh, functionalities uh, themselves. Okay, if there are no follow-up questions and follow-up comments, then I think we can wrap it up. And from my side, thank you once more for your attention. And uh, these are the emails, feel free to contact. And... Yeah, also thank you very much uh, from my side. Um, yeah, as Jasmine said, um, if you have any further questions, uh, feel free to contact us and uh, we are happy uh, yeah, to follow up on this. Have a nice afternoon. And have a nice the rest of the conference. Bye.